three, two, one. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Rocket Lasso Live. I am Chris Schmidt, and we're going to be ask, answering Cinema 4D questions live from the chat on Twitch and from YouTube. I already said some hellos in the pre-recording here, so we're just going to jump right on in and see what we've got from everybody. Let's get the right screen here, and we've got some uh, a bunch of links popping up here in the Twitch chat. So let's scroll around to what we got. Um, Hmm, Mick has got a question saying, how would you create a grayscale height map that retains all the detail of this? Ooh, look at that. Um, um, interesting. Um, it's a good question because um, you can see that there's a, this is almost, if you were just to build a regular like depth, like a Z pass here, for, well, first of all, uh, this and knee pick, and then this is by Lil Lyquilong Q Q Q. So, uh, but it's a good question because a normal Z pass, like if the elephant was more in front, then the front of the elephant isn't going to go as far back. Um, so this is almost like some sort of relative height map. Um, now the way the way my brain is seeing this is this looks more like it was made in Illustrator that this isn't this isn't a depth mat map made from 3D. It feels I mean it looks really good, but I don't know the process. But the way like some of the ear curves around and some of the stuff is kind of flat, so it's distinguishing itself from what's around it is making me curious about. Uh, how that's all layered up. Now, it's a good question. I actually don't have an instant answer. So it goes more to, and if anybody, like if it pops in anybody's head of the way to, uh, that you might do it, but um, I'm trying to think of what's the best way of making something that we can simulate. Well, see, even that gets challenging because I was going to say we could maybe use a Fresnel shader. So it would be something, you know, uh, just imagine that we had, well, don't imagine. I'm going to literally put this together. We can scale this way up and move it over. It's just, you, you just see that, you know, we can have something like that. Where it's like, okay, he's he's there and he's flat and he's got all this curvature to him. And if we were to make several, I'm just doing using this because it's got a little bit of extra information. Uh, if we were viewing this from the front angle and we make a material, and I will just use the luminance channel and we can feed it a Fresnel, which is right here. So you feed a Fresnel and we'll invert this so it's very straightforward. And I will create a null and feed it through all of them. And we'll hit NA so we can see directly. I don't think it's going to render terribly different. Now, the advantage to this type of thing is that there's no, this isn't about depth at all. It's purely about the angle that it's facing the camera. And all the depth is going to come from just the way that they're layered up. Now, uh, yeah, we could take the edge off this a little bit by pulling off the black. I'm just making it a little bit lighter gray. And I mean, just based on the image we were seeing, if we were to be a little more subtle. Um, I don't know, I let, I'm going to throw it into a cloner and let's just make a lot of these so we can get something but look got a bunch of them now i think we can even make multi instances which should run incredibly quickly turn on a random effector and introduce some crazy rotation in here and because we now have a multi instance i should be able to make tons of these uh all right throw that also in here so Render, I mean, it's, it looks almost exactly the same as in the viewport. So you can see how yeah, we've got all, we've got lots of information here and it's it's based on the angle. Now the next shader I might be inclined to use. In fact, I'm gonna throw this into a layer shader so I can uh, try the next one, which is going to be something like the fall off. So this is creating a, it's directional based. Now it's completely overriding the previous one. It's as if it's not even there. 
and it, this one should render differently now the by default we're looking at this from i believe yeah we're looking at this completely flat from the front so you can see that everything on the top of the model is going to be fully white and everything on the bottom is going to be black. But if we make it face the camera and we can actually even do this three dimensionally so I can go to these angles. If I make the space the camera, then I think that should pretty much render the same. But now this is relative to the POV of the camera. So I think it's well, that's X, Y, Z. It's probably Z. So I'm going to type in one on Z and now it's going to behave a lot like a Fresnel. And it actually might be identical to a Fresnel. Yeah, it might be identical to a Fresnel, um, except that there's a front and the back. So the halfway point here is actually the halfway point. So we'd have to go right to this point with the black color if we wanted it to the, get the full range. So it's actually, yeah, going from white to black. Is it any different than what we had before? Um, not really. I mean, you could start stylistically introducing um, some additional angle into it, which is, I mean, this is a depth mat map in a way. It's like, oh, no, it's not. It's not a depth mat. Um, but it does kind of show the height and it's all flattened out. But like that point would be as high as that point, which would be as high as and like anything white. It's going to be the same height map. But I still think they pop through pretty well. Um, and then, those, you know, these curves do go further back. Now, the problem with this, this technique is that it's going to break down a lot when uh, we show something that's more geometric. If it's not curved, if it's not very rounded, you, you're going to lose that information. So as we drop this in, you can see that uh, the color here is like this angle, like this entire part of the shape is exactly the same color. So it's not transitioning from one to the other. It's just going to be a flat panel, a flat panel, a flat panel. So yeah, that, that is the limitation here. Uh, I'm going to check the, um, the, uh, I'm pretty sure the original image, uh, Paul, I, I don't think it's a height map because if it was a height map, um, then there wouldn't be, you can see in the original image, the nose goes to full white parts of the elephant go to full white. Um, and then there's full white, there's full white, but that's clearly behind that, which is behind that. Um, and it's not as far forward. So I, so this isn't just a straight up height map. So it's almost like you'd need a relative height map, but I don't think that there is such a thing. And you have to start applying it to each individual object and it starts becoming very individual. That would be like applying a different projection on top of every single little thing, which is doable. I mean, um, and actually, maybe, you know, maybe at the end of the day, there isn't just a button you can click. Um, uh, Dean, uh, putting your money on subsurface scattering. That's a, no, intelligent machine. I also agree. It, it, the idea here is that it's, it's a relief sculpture, which means it was actually sculpted to be quite flat. Um, the, the additional way of thinking of that, um, I don't have anything I'm going to sketch here accurately, but if we were to, uh, let's go to sculpt mode and subdivide, 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 and use the pull tool and start drawing. You would imagine if you drew that character, you, know, you drew something. So, you know, we'd be creating, you know, we're creating something like essentially a, a perfectly flat height map. And you could imagine adding a lot of uh, adding a lot of detail in certain places where, uh, let's see, what's an example? Let's just say, okay, so here's a face. So I'm going to draw, you know, and there's a little bit of extra detail there where there's a face and then there's a smile. And I thought I put plenty of subdivisions, but yeah, so there's a little smile there. Put it on some eyelids. And, and you know, you can draw out the entire character. Whee! Uh, and then, you know, when you, when you're in 3d, it's like, okay, there's actually, it's very flat. There's not a lot of depth to it and you could start drawing a perspective. And so it almost turns into that, like you would be drawing with depth. And if we were to translate that on here, so that's what I think 
Well, I, that's not what I think. I think that image is not a depth map. I think it's an illustration. And if you were to draw as a depth map, you'd have to do it kind of like this. You know, when you see like a relief on like the, like on a shield, like if it's like a Roman shield and there's a battle sequence on the front of it, it's not like that's full depth. It's like a flattened depth. So you take like a little hammer and you go ding, 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 and you hammer it from behind and you uh, layer these. So this would be a, a, an actual more detailed way of going about doing something like that. Um, and then if you're going to do this three-dimensional one, then let's go back to standard. And um, if you're going to try and be artsy with depth map on something a little more complicated, and this is still running, not super fast. I'll drop that down a little bit. Um, I'll create a duplicate of this material. And... This time, just create a gradient. This is actually the, my preferred way of this type of setup would be, we're just going from black to white uh, with that straightforward gradient. And if I were to apply this to a singular object, I would put it on a flat projection. And this flat projection, we can rotate it this orientation. So negative 90 with my current setup. And T for scale, I can scale it down until it's perfectly matching that object. So now that object kind of has its own unique depth. And then let's say all of these figures were supposed to be another one. So I can copy that onto there and then scale this up until they all have their own unique depth mat applied. I mean, technically we'd move this up and try and match it. So we could start doing this on an object per, you know, an object by object basis. We could apply another one onto this figure and it's not in an absolute orientation, unfortunately, but that figure could be moved way forward, in which case he'd be beyond white and he wouldn't get any depth. But by applying this once again, uh, I'm trying to think of an easy way I could project the material on him with his rotation. Nothing's jumping to mind, so I'm just going to put him into a null and zero out the axis of that null and now if i apply the material there it should be flat again and now it's very easy for me to place but you have to, i can't do that with a big global null because everything's gonna have its own so you can see that even though he's way more frontal he has a full z pass from the front of him to the back of him i can't think of any automatic way of doing that but you can see how he's layered in front but now he can have a point darker than the ones behind him so i think we kind of covered the ramifications of that type of thing. It would be neat to, I mean, if I was a better painter and or sculptor, painting a depth, uh, sculpting and getting, you know, painting a relief could be really cool. Um, and I mean, you can even do it in Photoshop where you just paint with black and white, but you're not painting. Well, what's the right way to say it? You don't paint with, uh, you're not painting detail, you're painting depth. So, that would be an interesting exercise, but it could be totally done. Totally. Um, I don't know if it's worth saving any of these files, but I'll save this one. Uh, quick heads up that if you're, especially if you're new here, I have a Patreon set up and all these scene files get posted to the Patreon. So. Uh, ba, 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 ba. Let's see, back to the chat. Um, cycles can do something like this with 3d displacement. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, you can, if we have a depth map already, we could do displacement for sure, but that's not, uh, the result. And it, essentially what we would need is a shader that's doing what I just did manually. And I, you know, you might be able to have some sort of script or maybe some advanced setup in a node-based material where it's like looking at the object's bounding box and mapping its UVs to that bounding box. There's potential. Um, oh, vector displacement. Is that, would that be a thing? I don't know if vector displacement would be a thing, but I know what you mean. But I don't think vector, like that gives you your direction. The problem, it gives you your direction, but it doesn't give you depth. So it would, it would, it, it would have the same problem. Vector displacement would have the same problem we are having with this shape, which is, um, that a vector displacement, this entire shape right here would be flat. If it was blue, it'd be solid blue. So you're not getting additional information of like, it should have a gradient as it goes back, not just a flat shape. 
Um, okay, I'm looking for new questions. Back to Twitch, hard to find. Uh, we got some links, but we have a typed out question. Um, Paul is asking, how can you rotate clones outward via the center so each clone faces outwards on its own axis, not the world axis? Um, you might, let's say you rotate a cube via spherical. Uh, so let's say you rotate a cube via a spherical fall off. Each clone is rotated facing outward. Okay, so you want to take on... Uh, you want to take on the orientation of a field, essentially. Uh, I think, actually, it, the basic version of this might be pretty straightforward. I shall show you via... Let's make a cloner and a cone. And we will make a grid of them. So we won't go overboard. Let's just go 5 by 5 by 5 so we've got all these cones they are all facing an orientation. We can very clearly see that. And now let's say you want them all radiating outward as if they were kind of cloned onto a sphere, but if they're cloned on a sphere, they won't take on the proper rotation. So if this works, I think it's actually pretty straightforward. I was doing a lot of this lately, trying to figure out the dragon scales we did. And if you turn on the target effector, then they all kind of rotate and they're going to look a little bit weird there. But specifically what we want is we're going to change the target to field direction. In R20, when they added fields, they added, um, actually R21, they added field direction. I'm not sure. But in any case, we now have field direction. So I'm going to turn on the field direction. And inside the fall off, we will feed, say, a spherical field and give it a whole bunch of radius and zero at that fall off. And let's make sure that, yeah, that should be the field, that's direction. So that is now uh, radiating outward. Actually, the target might've already kind of done it, but let's use the field. And we just have to use the correct direction. So right now it's using pitch. Uh, so this probably has to be Z plus, there we go. So if we turn on Z plus, you see they're all aiming at the center. If we were to turn on Z minus or in the target, say uh, reverse heading, this should flip them around. You see they're all aimed outward. Actually, it looks pretty cool. I like how the circles are all kind of implying an internal circle. Um, but the the reason right now, it just seems like we could have done that with a regular target. And you can see as I move this, it's going to change the orientation that they're facing. Uh, but uh, it, it suddenly becomes not like the target at all as soon as we turn this into a different type of field. So if I were to turn on, um, what's a good one? Well, let's just do a cylinder. So we'll do a cylindrical field. And it has to be, once again, I think it has to be large enough to capture all of them. And there you go. You can see they're radiating out now like a cylinder. So it's now the orientation that the field would be getting created. So as long as they're inside of the fall off, and of course we could combine these or fields, so we could add as many of them as we want inside of the fall off, create a spherical field as well, T for scale. And now you can see that we'll transition into that second one. So the, it's still using the target object, but the tar target object is facing the orientation of the field. And just um, for extra clarity, the orientation that we're getting, you'll be able to visualize if you create a uh, simulate forces field force. With a field force, we can drag that cylinder field in and display. It's they're they're in there. They're just really tiny, so I gotta in begin our box. New. Uh, I think I hit scale. Yes, no. Maybe. Crank that up. And now I'm just gonna type in 777, 777. Now you can see we've got all of these lines. They're really small, but you can see that they should they're really tiny. So I think we can scale the length by 10. There we go. Now you can see that they are, I know you're going to change, don't display this line density, display vector length. I thought we could yeah, turn on brightness. There we go. So they're all the same color now. And you can now probably see all of the, yeah, you can see them all radiating outward. And it's always very difficult to visualize the field for. So I always recommend 
viewing it two dimensionally. So I'm going to set Y, I'm going to set uh, X, Y, Z, Y to zero. And then you see it's a two dimensional plane, which means we get a cross section of it. It's a lot easier to see that these are all radiating outward if we don't have a million of them overlaying on top of each other. So yeah, field force can automatically give you, or not field force, uh, target can give you the field direction and you just feel in fields. So hopefully that answers that question. Um, let me save this. I guess the radial there is fine. I'll turn this one on because it looks cooler. And we'll save this file for Patreon. Field direction. Do, 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 do. Um, Pixel is asking, is it possible to rotate a selection of MoGraph clones around a custom null. Goodness gracious. Um, oh, I didn't even think about that Sphere Factory. That would have been amazing. I should have done something like that. They're saying, uh, they, they said in the chat, somebody said, uh, what are we making? And they said, we're making a, a making donuts in Blender. It would have been great to have like some other piece of software open and not even acknowledge it. Just watch me stumbling through... Uh, through like 3D Studio Max or something. That would be great, but I didn't think of it, so oh well. Um, rot okay, somebody's asking about rotating around a null. Let's see if this is possible. So uh, I'm gonna use the same rig we just made and I'm gonna put in cubes instead, T for scale. All right, so we got a bunch of cubes. So can we rotate a selection of clones around a null. So we are going to use fields and an inheritance effector. That's the plan. So uh, let's begin with an inheritance effector and then see if we can limit it. So we need the MoGraph menu, inheritance, and inheritance mode direct, create a null. I'm going to move the null to this corner right there. Actually, I'll move it to this back corner. And let's feed that in as our source. Now everything just moved over. And that's direct. I've, I've, always, I've used inheritance before, but I've used them in very direct ways. Now, yeah, you can see if I rotate the null, everything's rotating, but the entire thing jumped over. But we do have position turned on. So if I turn off position and I start spinning, Oop, and I start spinning the null. Okay, everything's rotating to match the null, but they're not moving to match the null. So uh, I'm not sure we're fully there yet, but if we were to, let's make a selection of some sort. So uh, we need a MoGraph selection tag, MoGraph selection. And then inside of here, I'm gonna control it using fields just so we can automatically do this instead of selecting them manually. So I'm gonna make a spherical field. Shouldn't be a child. We'll move it up to that same approximate place or the exact place of the null, but I don't want it to be a child right now. T for scale, scale it up. And now you can see that several of our, I'm gonna give it no fall off. You can see a bunch of them are selected. Okay, fair enough. Inheritance should only deal with things inside of that MoGraph selection. There's several limitations we, we might run into here, one of which would be possibly um, the selection changing as it passes through the field, but we'll deal with that as we get there. So uh, back to this. Currently, we're saying don't worry about position. So let's try rotating. Rotate the null. And now you can see that those are spinning based on a null. Um based on that selection, which is fine. That's cool. And now let's turn position on again and everything's gonna jump over there. Now that, I mean, that could actually work by itself because if we zero this null out, I think it's, everything's gonna be back. It's looking at that null, maybe based on relative to the cloner. So actually, yeah, this might work well. If we were to, let me hit undo. So my null's still in that corner spot. And now I'm gonna make, I'm gonna hit Alt G and group that. But then let's move this null. I'll take it out for a moment zero out its position and then make it a child of this one. So we'll just call that one, this is the corner. And then this one is the inheritance null. 
So this is on the corner. So if I were to rotate this, we're moving that null based on, we're moving the center null, but based on this pivot point. So there we go. We have now moved a selection of clones based on something completely external from it. I've actually never done that before. I know that the, the inheritance is pretty powerful. And yeah, we can just move this anywhere we want. This entire chunk of clones. It's actually pretty powerful. Just yip, yoink, yoink some clones away. And it's not passing through the spherical field. Um, I was worried that the spherical field would change it, but it's fine. So yeah, we could move this and then we can, we should be able to move our spherical field and you're going to, oh, it gets a little twitchy there. I'm not sure if it would render that way, but it's updating the selection to what should be included. Actually, that's really, it does not like the MoGraph selection changing there. Um, if I were to turn off and on the inheritance, yeah, you see it refreshes. So there's maybe some sort of refresh issue. Maybe we want to change the order of operations. Um, maybe, I don't know. The uh, I am just kind of curious about that because changing that selection could be important and powerful, but it might, if we were hitting, if we have play, it doesn't actually refresh properly. So that could be, that could be potentially an issue. Um, let me, I, I, this is probably a super dead end. Uh, I do want to keyframe this just for uh, the saved file for later. Let's, um, how do I, I didn't put that in the corner. Oop, there, there we go. Redo. Oh no, I have it turned off. Undo, 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 do, 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 do. Yes. Okay. It's back. Um, what we could do is that's in this corner. Uh, I've been trying to do this more. We have underneath coordinates. There's something called freeze transformation right now. It's in this whole relative position, which is really weird and difficult to control in the past. And I mean, still sometimes I'm not fully sure if this is what's the better method, but in the past I would kind of put this into a null. I grab this corner and say alt G and then call this, I'd usually call it the same name corner and then say zero. So that's the zeroed out location. So you can see this one, the coordinates are zero, zero, zero. So if I had to grab this and move it and it looks like it didn't refresh. If I had to grab this and move it and rotate it and do all the stuff and it'd be like, Oh, dang it, I need to put this back. I don't know where that goes. I can just now click in the corner and hit reset PSR and boom, it jumps back. An alternative, I've been trying to use the workflow, but I'm not sure I fully trust it yet, is we can just click inside of freeze transformations. We can say freeze, and now that number moves down here. It stores its relative position, and now its coordinates are zero, 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 which means we should be able to grab this, rotate it, move it, and then hit reset PSR, and it's gonna jump back to the same spot. I don't know which workflow is better, but that's two different options that you have. So let's call this move me. And yeah, that can get moved and that's really neat. Um, so this is, let's save this. And then I might go down a little bit of a rabbit hole here, but I'm curious if it will work because we're kind of seeing some refresh issues there. Um, move clones based on null. Uh, this will probably make for a good quick tutorial. Just like, hey, you can move some clones there. I got to think about that. Uh, I might make a quick tutorial of that. So somebody in the chat, think of a something, what would be a good like visual MoGraphy application of this? Like, oh, it's a, you know, it's a, a bunch of clones or something and a bunch need to move for a reason. Last time I asked that question, it was about the cloth and somebody said, do a product reveal. I was like, oh my God, that's the most amazing idea. Um, so yeah, if you have any ideas for like how to move some of those, eh, that might work. The Rubik's Cube. I don't know if the Rubik's Cube would actually work here because you need to keep changing the selection. So think of something else, but I'll keep that in mind. But in any case, I want to see if we can fix this refreshing issue. Uh, so we'll, we shall do it by keyframing the radius and we'll keep changing the radius over 90 frames. So it's going to get slowly bigger, selecting everything. And um, we can just have this move over that same time. So I'll grab the coordinates and the rotation, record it at the time of zero, fast forward all the way to the end, move the whole thing, and everything's moving correctly. Rotate, everything's moving because we're at the end. So now if we rewind, those we'll probably see those. Actually, no, um, no, not quite. They start, they start, they do start eventually freaking out, even though the first couple seem to work. Okay, so you see that's happening now. The first test to do is does that happen in the render? I have a feeling it will. 
So I'm gonna out, let's just uh, output a very low res, oops, 720 by 720. All frames, zoom in, don't save. Go. Do, 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 do. Yeah, it, the same, yeah it, it is indeed happening there. Okay, it, it's, uh, it's too bad, but we'll see. Um, let's see. Um, let's see, I'm just looking at the answers that people are saying, or a, a flock of birds, planes in the sky, but breaking away. I'm trying to think of something that would be very specific. Um, hmm. Removing, yeah, that's, that's an interesting question. But anyway, let me finish the current thought. I just didn't want to miss some chat if somebody had a really good idea. Um, it could be like a bunch of puzzle pieces on the ground and you're trying to like pull different pieces away to reveal different things. I don't know. I'm going to think about it. But I mean, it could just be like a little quick tip about the technique. But I would like to do a real world application instead of a full tutorial because um, I got to start thinking of ideas for those quicker ones. Anyway, uh, so this is not refreshing properly. But we did see that if the inheritance turns off and on, it does refresh. So if we turn that off and on, it is correct. Now, this is really goofy, but we're going to attempt something and see if it works. I have actually gotten this to work on something in the past, um, but I kind of doubt it'll work here. But if it does work, it's novel. I'm going to create an Espresso. So here's an Espresso tag, and we're going to control the inheritance. And Espresso calculates every single frame. So every time there's a refresh, in fact. So what I'm going to do is search for a time node. So here's time. Actually, do we even need a time node? We don't even need a time node. What am I doing? All I want is a constant. So here's a constant. And setting this to bool, we can say if it's true or false. So I'm going to say it's false. And now here's a second one. And this one is true. And actually, we'll do this with two different tags, in fact. So this is saying, okay, inheritance, I want you to always turn off. So we can do this real easily by going to the basic tab, dragging enabled onto inheritance. I'm gonna say, this tag is telling you always turn off. Right now, if I try and turn this on, it's gonna just keeping it, turning itself off. So here's where it gets weird. Expresso will calculate from left to right and based on its priority order. So I'm gonna make a second Expresso tag also saying the same thing. And I'm gonna make it calculate later. So let's just try one frame later. And one frame later, I'm gonna say, now, Espresso is telling you to turn on again. So, Espresso said turn off, and then Espresso is saying turn on. And it calculates after. So, if this is, did I, oh, I actually, this is important. I do this all the time. Um, I, when I just updated it, I hadn't double clicked the new Espresso tag, so I was still in the old one. If you copy it, you're still in the old one. So, let me make sure that the first one that I have is false, and the second one that I have is true. There we go. So, now you can see it is true. So, we have an Espresso tag saying, hey, turn off. So, but then we have a second one saying, nope, turn on. So I'm going to try and turn it off now and it keeps turning itself on. Now that by itself maybe could work. If I play, let's see if anything happens. No, it's still twitchy. Um, so what we can do is start trying to crank up the calculation order. So I'm going to have it happen way later. Now these are both in the expression. So I don't expect that to work because the previous one didn't. But what could work is setting the first tag to something like initial. So that's actually calculating earlier. And it still, still doesn't like it. And then let's grab the other one. I'm going to put it on the latest possible time at the end of generators and see if that one... No, see, that one, now it's not even calculating at all. I pushed that one too far. Let's reset that to zero, see if it does it. Nope, too far still. I guess expression is as late as we can go. So yeah, it's turning off and turning on, but it's not it's not forcing a refresh. I had gotten that to work with a, a wind, wind effect, a wind force one time. I was able to say turn on, turn off. So too bad it didn't work. Uh, I was hoping it would. Um, so that's one, I mean, so that's not liking it. Now, the next thing to potentially try, get rid of those, is, is there any way to bake a MoGraph selection tag? I don't think there is, honestly. Hmm.
I wonder if we can use a MoGraph weight instead of a MoGraph selection. Let's try it. Uh, I don't know why they'd be different, but hey, you never know. MoGraph weight map. And, oh, you can't use, oh, you have to paint with this, so you can't use fields. I thought you could use fields with a MoGraph weight. Oh, you can. There it is. Um, spherical field. Okay, it should be the exact same thing. So that's all transitioning, but we need, let's see if it works. If we tell it to limit to uh, the weight. I don't even know if that's a thing you can do. Oh, dang. Oh, I, I mean, the weight map works in general, but it's not working for this being animated. But now that's a weight map, I still don't think there's a way to bake it. It'd be actually pretty neat if there's a bake tag. But sadly, there is not. Um, I can't think of any way around. If anybody has any idea, um, then that would be good. But... Uh, Bobby is asking if we could use a square wave to turn it on and off, uh, and enable per frame. Um, yeah, there's a lot of ways you could do it. Like uh, you could say every other frame you could feed into a modulo. You could take the time, feed the frame into a modulo, and then it would alternate as it kept on moving forward. Uh, so that every other frame it would turn on, off, on, off. Um, there are, there are definitely ways of creating a loop, but not a loop within a single frame because it's per refresh. Um, so yeah, just just making two different ones in order would maybe be a thing. Um, let's see. Well, I, I, that was just a little bonus thing. I was seeing if we could get that to work. It's nice that the weights work. And actually, something I'm a little surprised. Well, I guess we're using that uh, MoGraph weight animation. I wonder if that changes anything. No. Yeah, animation is all about transferring from uh, to a different object. So it has two different modes. Like these might as well be two different uh, effectors for how different they behave. But yeah, um, so we have a question in the chat from Yadaglo asking what my very, very first tutorial was. Um, that's a trickier question based on where is my stream? There it is. Uh, that's actually a trickier question than you might think because I started teaching Cinema 4D right away. I, I did two years of school with Cinema 40 and I got hired to teach it. So I was teaching cinema. So, you know, I was doing classes and instructing an entire classroom full of people on making things. Um, so I'm not going to count that as a tutorial. Um, so it goes to if the very first time I had something online with the intent to teach people, it would have been, and I, I used to be another layer is I used to be very active on CG Talk, which got rebranded to CG Society. It, it was an online forum. It still is um, all about, well, and it was all, all about CG and there's a Cinema 4D subreddit. And I used to spend a lot of time on there. I had a lot of posts and I would answer tons and tons of questions. And uh, so I'd answer lots of questions on there, but there's no way I'm going to be able to find. Let me see what we can find because I'm sure it's super dead. 3D. Yeah, there used to be a publication called 3D Attack. And they were like a really early Cinema 4D kind of like publication. And yeah, I can't find the article. And actually, did I post it? Let me see if I can find it because I'm super curious. I'm, I'm just doing some Googling here while I'm talking. Um, it's going to be really hard to find. Because I bet uh, a lot of things don't get archived that way. I'd have to go through my history. Um, ba -ba 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 hmm. Is it worth the time? It'd be kind of neat as a memory lane type of thing. But I have to let's see. No, it's not even remembering my login right now, so I, I can't do it right now. Um, but my very, very first tutorial, I remember I started a thread on CG Talk, and I, I was like, hey, look at this little thing I made, and I posted a GIF, and pretty much I can just show you exactly what I made, and then everybody really liked it, so I ended up making a, a tutorial for it, and then 
the 3D Attack magazine asked me if I would make the tutorial for them. So my first tutorial ever was not a video. It was actually a written out tutorial. Um, so this was pre dynamic. It was pre uh, soft bodies and rigid bodies. So we didn't have those yet, but we did recently have cloth. So if we take this plane and I make it a cloth collider, and then we take this shape here, which I shouldn't have made editable yet. We'll just subdivide it and subdivide it again and add a simulation cloth onto it. Then that should be able to be cloth and fall. But now we're treating it as a volume object instead of a piece of cloth. And cloth was always kind of advertised as a, you know, it's for cloth. So then I, you know, you put a bunch of iterations of stiffness. And if you make that high enough, it's actually become a very stiff object here. So you can see boing, boing. And then, uh, and then you put tear. I'm going to say use tear. And to be able to see tearing happen, you have to put it into a cloth surface. If you hold down Alt, it becomes apparent automatically. I've been doing that a lot lately, which is great. So now we should be able to see a tear. Now it's going to be, it's going to be, as you add more iterations, it starts, um, it starts sliding around a lot. I'm going to say zero bounce and a lot of friction. Yeah, it seems to sort of control it. And then we make a simulate a tractor. It was the only thing that we had. And I'm just going to do it very quickly because I'm not worried about it chasing. I'll just do it right there. So at the time of seven, I'm going to make this a tractor. We'll keyframe the strength. So previous frame, or at this frame, it's going to be uh, zero. And then one, two frames later, I'm going to set the strength to negative, I don't know, 5,000. And hit one more frame. Does it, uh, it might not get included right away. Forces expert. Limit to two. No, it should be applying right away. Now it's really stiff, so that actually might be fighting it. So I'm going to change this number at a zero. And it turned on, but it's forcing it down. We need to make it very easy to tear. So 101. Hit. Well, that's uh, that's tearing it a little too much. But if we were to put some vertex maps on there, and maybe not make it quite tear it quite so much, then yeah, it would like rip the object apart and you give it a little bit of thickness. And I, you know, I was doing that kind of thing. Where it was like, oh, you can actually make an object explode into different pieces. And then I had a different piece sweep in and push it out of the way. And it was like. It was the most attention I'd ever gotten on the internet up to that point was everybody in the forum was like, how do you do that? It's crazy. And it's just so simple to what we do these days. It's uh, crazy how much more sophisticated we've all become as a community. It's really, uh, it's really fun and crazy. So that was, uh, that was the oldest, oldest thing I did um, for the internet was that. Uh, ba 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 ba. Let's see, lots of rotation questions today. Um, from X Thomas, how do you do a rotation mechanism like this? I like the word mechanism. Cute. All right, we got some Instagram. This is from Oscar Peterson. And let's see what we got. Um, I want to make sure that I'm going to kill the audio if there is any. Uh, oh, cute. Um, now, first of all, from Oscar Peterson, workout wheel. And yeah, there's definitely some music. Um, uh, well, okay, there's two different versions of this. One is that they actually mechanically made it. And the other is um, just uh, like building the espresso version so that it is going to... Actually, I'm kind of curious... The way these are, like, that wheel in relationship to that wheel would have to be a different speed. So this is fake. Um, it's it's faked. Um, not, not that everything in 3D isn't faked. But this wheel is a larger radius than that wheel, which would mean this wheel would be spinning at a different speed than that one would, I think. Because um, the relationship is different. So uh, unless I would just spin twice as fast. I don't know. I don't know. But uh, mechanically speaking, this isn't too crazy. 
Um, so let's see what we can do. I want to, let's see, what's our, I want to make a version that's a little bit different. But, I mean, the, the idea here being three wheels, we just make sure all the radiuses are very different. Um, so uh, let's start with a cogwheel. We actually don't use this that often, even though I loved this tool when it came out. I made a crazy amount of uh, gear systems. Actually, I'll pull this up because I, I think I really like it. Um, let's see. I'll pull it over here just so I can find. Uh, back at Grayscale Gorilla. Um new feature cinema 4d gear let's see if i can find it not in r21 no oh maybe here maybe 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 oh yeah this is back when yeah when that's okay so here's a post so uh the new gears were there and i went totally nuts on the gears i mean there's a lot of really fun things first of all this one was really neat uh, i just keyframed this like so quickly but um, it was really fun to uh, rig that with the... And I, I don't know if I've ever used that tag since. That was the uh, interaction tag. So instead of having controls, you can make a selection of polygons, be able to what you can drag around. And then uh, there's all these gears here, and I went totally nuts on them. And this uh, this is actually dynamics happening. Like, there's this is not... I think, uh, yeah, there's not even any keyframes here. What's happening is these are... Uh, there's a bunch of particles here generating dynamic cubes, and those are actually the weight is actually turning that wheel, which turns that gear, which turns that gear, which turns that gear, and all these rotations, and everything are are actual mechanical connections. So yeah, I wanted to see what kind of motion I could get out of it. So yeah, even this, you know, being able to get a switch going back and forth. So the Cinema 4D gears are actually really cool because they give you the proper gear ratios. And I just want to see how far I could push the different systems. So. That was really, really fun. Um, so I highly recommend the Cinema 4D gears. You're making really cool looking ones. But um, OK, so let's see what we can do here. Um, I'm not super particular. The uh, Hey, Rick, how's it going? Um, try a freeze layer above the spherical field. Oh, yeah, that's an interesting idea. Well, I'm going to go back. I know we're jumping around a little bit extra today, but if we got Rick in the house, then we got to see if we can uh, get that working properly. I don't know if I saved that one. So we'll go here. Yeah, it's got the same growth. So Rick is saying, let's try adding a freeze layer. And then we have to add a Mac. Oh, let's, he's saying use Max. We could probably use add or screen as well. No, it doesn't like it. Um, I don't like, let's see. Yeah, max blending, max mode, auto update. Let's turn on auto update. <gasps> Ooh, there you go. Ha! Ah, Rick had the solution. So um, let me try add as well. Yeah, add also works as normal mode work. Okay, so it can't be normal. But anything that's added to it. So all we did was we added a freeze layer. So it's acknowledging what used to be there. And it's going to acknowledge the growth now as it goes. Um, and if, as long as we add some sort of additive layer, like max add or screen, then it's taking the value and moving it over. Um, that does, well, I mean, there's still the limitation that we'd have to, potentially if you wanted to shrink it or move, have this be moving around, that could get dangerous, but the auto update does seem to acknowledge it. So yeah, that's an important detail. I'll save this as another version. Thank you very much, Rick. I'm glad I caught that or caught you in the chat. Um, and uh, Rincon, thank you very much. You. Got a job because of uh, everything that me and Nick were doing over at GSG. I super appreciate that. And that's awesome that uh, that, that happened. Thanks for coming and hanging out and watching and supporting me over here. Uh, anyway, going back to the gears. Um, I want to keep this pretty straightforward. Um, there's a lot of things we could do with dynamics that would take a while and... But I, let's just try to do it with some visual gear ratios. So if I were to make a second gear, and we can just visually move it into what should be about the proper spot. And something that's cool is if we change the teeth, it's going to shrink the radius. But now it's still a perfectly compatible gear here. And then we can do that again. And this time we'll add 30 gears. And we'll move this one over here. So we kind of get something that looks like it might be able to sort of drive. So we've got all these together. 
and yeah, we can get up, we can get the piston thing going as well. So here's my thought. Let's create a null and everything will go into the null. Now, I might even keep this like visually as splines. Um, so now, uh, whatever our master gear is, let's just have this one be the main one. I will add an espresso tag. This is the way I typically do this. Add some espresso. We need the cogwheel, the axis it is on, which I, I'm still bad at guessing. We just rotate a little bit, that's on B. So we want to have that rotate on B. It's a little quicker to grab the letter B here and drag it out. So B is going to be output from there. It's going to control the B of that and the B of that. Um, I think you can only drag it from the object it actually is. I kind of wish you could drag it from a similar object, but you can't. So two different rotations, but we need to gear them differently. But because of the math of gears and the, the ratios, and because Cinema automatically did the ratios for us when you typed in different numbers of teeth, it's pretty simple to just we use a range mapper, or in this case, we can even just search for, I'm going to search for a math node. And we can input in the math, and I'm going to output a multiply. We're going to multiply by some ratio and go into one, and we'll multiply by some ratio and go to the other. So we could kind of go down the chain. So it's like that could multiply to that, and then the result of that could drive that. But they're all coming from the same object, so there's no reason to do that. Now, we made this one have half as many teeth, so it's my guess it's going to go twice as fast. I don't know for sure, but I'm going to say multiply by two. But not only is it going to go by two, I think it's going to go by negative two. And then, well, let's just try that one. So that's happened. Now, if I rotate this, oh, okay, cool. I guessed correctly. You can see that that is now spinning properly. And now, uh, the same idea is going to be applying to this one, but that one has, I think we gave it 30 this one had 30 teeth and we're basing it off one that has 20. So the math there would be, um, it's gotta go slower. So I think it's gonna be, I'm gonna say one divided by three times two. I might have done that backwards. So yeah, 0.66. It'd actually be 0.66666 repeating forever. Um, and it's not gonna be reversed because that reverses it and then that would reverse to that. So that actually might be all we need to do is that ratio is like it's two times bigger or it's three times bigger. So I converted the ratio by multiplying by three and dividing by two. So let's see if we get that right. Oh, we got it right again on the first try. So the point being is they both rotate the correct direction and one of them is gonna drive everything else. So all we have to do is spin this and all the other ones will adapt. And of course, you, know, you could spend time playing with the different teeth and changing um changing the way they uh, interact a little bit like we can make this one a little bit you know a little bit shallower and then make this one look a little bit beefer beefier we can put the internal parts which are really cool things like uh like this i don't you know like i said i don't play with this nearly enough you can do these cool gear shapes there's a bunch of them built in there i really really do like them the uh, gears speak to uh i don't know aesthetically gears are just really cool to me so there we go we got some some slightly more interesting looking gears there. Now, let's see if we can get some very basic connections going back and forth. And I kind of like, uh, we're going to keep these being splines. And uh, basically, we if we're building some sort of like little hydraulic looking thing, uh, I'm going to create a circle. And we're just kind of building a rig here. So imagine if this was going to become three-dimensional, but we'll keep it 2D. So I'm going to colorize these gears a color. So I'm going to say on, and uh, we'll have the gears be nice bright purple. And now we can focus on some new ones. So I'm going to T for scale, scale both the square and the circle, pretty small. And eh, I'm going to scoot it right there. I guess the placement's somewhat arbitrary, so I can scoot it here. And now we've got this rectangle and in fact, I think it'd be quickest to make that editable. You can see it's going to be pivoting right from its main spot. So I can grab the points and I'll pull, turn off axis and pull the points over a little bit. T for scale, scale down a little bit. And I can grab these points and scoot them over as far as I want. And, um, oh yeah. So yeah, this is going to become like this inner piston. So we'll do something like that. And now I'm going to copy and paste the circle 
and scoot it over here. And it can be in any arbitrary place again. So we'll just try it there. And it's gonna be a little bit bigger. So I'm gonna T for scale, scale it bigger. And then this outer piston, that's gonna be a lot taller. And actually, although that might be fine, it might be a little bit long. We'll adjust that in a moment. Now, very important, you can see that X is the orientation we care about. So we'll call this, um, well, th this will just be circle one and this will be circle two. What we need is circle two to aim at one and one to two. So it's pretty straightforward. Uh, to keep it clean, I'm gonna add a rigging constraint tag. You can also use a target tag. Uh, it has the same functionality, but let's turn on the, we've got two, we get the up vector and the aim. I'm gonna avoid using the up vector. We might need it, but uh, all you do is say, what axis is it on? Well, you can see it's on X. So we'll say X plus, what is it aiming at? It's aiming at the other circle. Wink, aims right at it. Now we can copy this to the other one and click on it and say, what is it aiming at? It's actually aiming at two. And now they look directly at each other. Now all we have to do is adjust the length and uh, grab the points. And these might actually get incredibly close to each other. So this might be more difficult than I'm making it look because of the gear ratios that we happen to do. Um, so yeah, we're gonna have to just adjust it as we go. But um, by allowing these to overlap each other, it's going to behave, I mean, this is kind of realistic in that it's like a piston. A piston is like a cylinder inside of another cylinder. So um, let's make these a little more visual as well. Turn on. We'll make one of them green and it will feed into an orangey yellow. And now we need these to rotate. Um, what's a best way or well, the best way to do it would be with signal but let's do it with no plugin so i'll just keyframe it so here's our rotation i'm going to reset that to zero by right clicking the little up and down arrow keyframe it and go to the end and we'll have had it whoop, be very careful and spin it there and keyframe that it's going to accelerate and decelerate and now all we need to do is grab this one and make it a child of the gear it's related to and grab this one and make it a child of the gear it's related to and with any luck the orientations should take over and they're going to be forced to keep looking at each other now here's where i said it might get tricky is for how far or close they might get to each other so a couple of things we might let's just see what happens first of all i didn't spin it enough for our purposes so let's uh, more than double our timeline. I'm going to grab that point and move it way over. And then I'm going to grab it and rotate it three times as far. So it should do a couple, at least two full rotations here. So it's going to pull really far apart. But then you see they actually get, it's both getting too far and too close. So just by the gear ratios we're doing, especially since we're pushing from one to the other and not uh, like a single one. Um, so I'm a couple things we do. First of all, if we just move these closer to the center, that'll automatically fix it. Uh, and we can also move this into the second gear instead. So there should be less variation on that. So I place this here. Um, let's see, like, you know, so now these are closer. So there's gonna be less variation and you can now see it's gonna travel more. But once again, the, the ratios are still not such that it's quite working. So I can grab this circle. If I pull it a little closer to the center, eventually they should get to the point where they're within an acceptable tolerance. That actually still passes through it quite a bit. Um, but this is what when you're just making up mechanical ratios. Uh, yeah, that one's going to get too far. They, like That's the furthest it gets at this current ratio. It's almost super duper maximum. But if, I also, if this also gets too close, which it does, then, it would, then once again, they're just too, it's just too much of a difference in ratio. Yeah, there we go. I think this is finally uh, close enough where it's about, that one's barely getting to it. So now you can see that we get that gear turning and now you get the piston just attached from one to the other. And everything's being driven by, you know, a single thing being keyframed. And you get all this nice mechanical motion on top of it in a pretty straightforward way. And I mean, and these rigs are really 
you know, they're simple and robust. We can copy and paste those circle rigs, rename. And you saw I copy and pasted, and that maintains the relationship between tags. If you control drag, sometimes, it depends on the condition, this might have still be, been referring to circle two, but you see it instead, it went to the copy pasted version, which is circle four, which I've renamed. So if we leave this one pivoting from that location, and let's see, that is this one. So I'm going to add this in. So we have a second circle that's going to pivot from the same spot. And then I can grab this one and move it into our empty circle, which will be the top one, and move it probably, I'm going to put it right in the center. Then we should be able to have like a double, yeah, double piston thing going. And this one's probably just a little bit too long. So there we go. Like now we have visually two different pistons uh, and the ratios are not too bad there. This one, I mean, what I just did should have been a little bit shorter and it's counterpoint number four also needs to be a little bit shorter. Like essentially these are them at their longest ratio. Neat. Um, yeah, it's really fun doing these kind of gear setups. Now we, t we did this entirely with Expresso and just like some rigging tools. But like I said, you could also build this entirely dynamically where these would be constraint tags on dynamic objects. And one gear would actually be colliding with the second gear to create the rotations. Um, but yeah, building mechanical things is really fun. Uh, and then what's funny is, um, if I were to make this roll on the ground, actually, why don't we make it roll on the ground? Because I'm curious if the geared up ratio does work. Um, the, yeah, I want to see if this one's spinning is the same as that spinning because of the geared up ratio. So I'm going to show you what I do. The very not mathematical way of seeing if this is correct would be... Uh, we would make a floor in this case, I guess everything is two dimensional. So we'll make another spline and make it very wide. There, we've now got a floor. So if that was supposed to be running along the floor, my eyeballing of that was actually pretty good. If this entire thing is keyframed to move along, and I guess I, I will grab this null and I'm going to scoot it along. The Espresso is now no longer going to be driven via the rotation of that object. Or I guess, I guess it could actually. Yeah, that gets up. I guess it, yeah, it's kind of like uh, Ghostbusters, like the, the door opens both ways. This Espresso rig would work forward and backward. I've always made it so that the distance controls the rotation, but we could make the rotation control the distance. So let's see how well this works. It might not work well at all, but. Uh, we haven't saved it, so let's do that. Gears. So, um, uh, this is the gear mobile. Gear mobile. Um, okay, so this is going to be spinning. And as it spins, I want to change the X position of this entire little car here. We are going to drive this with a range mapper. If you haven't done too much with range mappers, it is the singular most powerful node in all of Espresso, in my opinion, just because you can take one set of numbers here being zero to one and map it to a different set of numbers here being zero and one. Uh, but we're going to input instead this rotation and <clears throat> the input, I'm going to say that it is inputting degrees, which is what it is doing. And we're going to have it output a position. Now I have like, just to show you, I have no idea what our inputs are right here. So anything could happen. So I'm going to put this in. It's going to jump somewhere. Boom. It jumped way over there. Now, uh, when I play, it's going to start spinning. It's going to probably move. It might move backwards. It might move really fast. It might move way too slow. It's going to be wrong, but it's going to give us something. You can now see that as this is rotating, it is moving in the correct direction, just way too slow. So we can tell right away that this should move further as that's rotating. So let's do that. I'm going to say, let's add a zero on there and see what it's doing. And actually, that's not bad. You can see right away that this rotation being translated into position is not bad. That's pretty, that's more accurate than I thought it'd be. Right now, we're just paying attention to this one. And I'm, after the fact, I'm curious if this one matches. 
So along those lines, uh, I want to visually be able to make sure if I'm getting the correct rotation. Um, what's the best way to do this? I, I, I was going to drop like a marker where it traveled to. Now, th you could look up the math. Like if we get the radius, the radius would translate to the circumference. We could do the pi equation. But I'm trying to show you like the, I don't, I don't want to do the math. So how do we just guess what the correct one is? And right now we're just getting a lot of uh, slippage. Like there's a lot of slipping happening. And honestly, we could just keep eyeballing it to the point where it's like, oh, it doesn't feel like it's eyeballing. If we were to get to the circumference of it, we could get the length and then that could be good. That actually might be a smart way to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, Dean. There is a there is totally the equation. Uh, I'm trying to show you if you don't know the equation because sometimes you don't know the equation. Um, uh, and the equation isn't even terribly hard necessarily, but it's going to be different every time. Um, so, well, I guess what, if we're just going to be doing the dumb method, then the super dumb method is is simply what we're doing here. And it looks like it's still slipping a little bit. So we just need to make this travel a little bit further. So let's try making it 100, adding an extra 100 there. And let's see if the gears feel like they're slipping. We can even frame by frame that a little bit. In fact, uh, what's the way I would usually exaggerate that? I, I have some technique I've done before where I, I make a marker it's like I would make just a little cube here. It's like, okay, that is, maybe it is just something like this where it's like, I'm going to frame forward. And then you can see right when, boop, that gear touches right there. I'm just going to take this cube and move it into the position so that I can see right there. That's where it should be staying. And now as I keep on going, you can see that right there essentially is where it would be leaving. And you see how far off I am. So having done that, I can just start dragging this up and go right there. And now it looks like it is in the same spot. Of course, it might change the beginning position a little bit as well. But let's see. Yeah, that look already looks a lot better. So I just completely eyeballed it. And now you can see that it looks like it's coming down and up without really moving the position. Very inaccurate, but it just goes to a certain point when, uh, when we're viewing this object. And if it's rotating and it's within 90% of what we're aiming for, it's just going to read as correct. Like you're not going to be able to tell that slipping. So yes, there is the mathematical equation, but for people who are not mathematically inclined, there you go. That's a way of doing it. So we hit play and now that should look like it's working pretty well. Now I just want to see if I'm frame by framing. Actually, that does look like if these gear ratios are maintained, maybe a larger gear with the middle one does maintain the same speed. It's traveling, it's bigger, but it's traveling slower. So it just kind of works. We. Yeah, working pretty well. Nice. Just a little bit of espresso. And it's really cool because of the rig we built here is like, we have a lot of control over it. So, you know, we could add more gears to the system and it's all just driven through an espresso tag. We can move these uh, pistons around anywhere. Even right now that this cog wheel is slightly off. It's slightly intersecting the ground. I guess both of them are slightly intersecting the ground. We can just move the entire rig up a little bit. But I, once again, I guess I eyeballed it really well. But if I was, uh, if this was slightly in the wrong position, just based on the rig we have, I could just take it and move it. And as long as these gears look like they're interacting correctly, then that would just continue to work. Like like the ratios all work, we can move it. So the when it comes to these types of ratio builds, it's actually pretty forgiving. There's a lot you can do with them. Woo woo. Neat. All righty. I call that a success. Um, let's see. Yeah, <laughs> I agree. Um, there's definitely, you know, when you're in school, and it's like, when am I ever going to use this math? I'm shocked at the amount of that math that would have turned out useful and how much I've had to go back and relearn, like, Pythagorean theorem and calculating angles and circumferences and all of those uh, different geometry-based things. I was always good at geometry, but um, yeah, learning some calculus and more uh, more of those details would have been useful. <sighs> yeah, trigonometry. Um, let's see. Uh, you guys, I'm a little ahead of you, so I'm looking for the next question. I know there's a bunch of extra questions earlier. 
Yeah, no, yeah, trigonometry could do all of it, but you saw how minimally we uh, were able to do the math on this one. Uh, Mick is in with another question. How would you create something similar to look like the geometry on this header image? Oh, and also Meeks is in here. I'm going to check out what you put Meeks, but I want to see what the one Meeks has because I think it's the one I told him to post from last week. Um, um, well, okay, you are linking to somebody's Patreon and they're, uh, they're creating food scenes in Houdini and you're asking how they might have made this image here. So this is... Uh, Ka, it's ka, ka, za, ka, ka, how would you say this? Ka, ka, kazinska, ka, kazinska. Um, honestly, these just look like, um, he's making something Houdini, which is the only reason I'm willing to tackle this. If it was any kind of cinema, then we wouldn't be, um, but. Based on that, I mean, I don't know if I'm seeing too much crazy there. Like, isn't that, if we were just, I'm just going to do the simplest possible version. If we were to make the figure, subdivide them a few extra times, triangulate it, and I think we can parametrically, let's see how par parametric we can be. I think we can parametrically triangulate him if we put a polygon reduction in him. So I'm going to search for the word poly, and we can get the old polygon reduction. I got to tell you, I like the old one better than the new one. They made a new one in cinema, but it takes all this time calculating and it has a different algorithm. But if we put that in, it's going to triangulate and subdivide a bunch. If we drop the reduction down to zero, then all it does is parametrically triangulate our object. So neat. Uh, so that's tr uh, parametrically triangulated. Create the awesome MoGraph MoExtrude. Make that a child. And it's going to super explode. I'm going to say, I only want one step. I don't want to push out on, uh, no, I guess we do want to push out on Z and we do want to shrink. It's just too much. So I'm going to say by one and let's have it shrink to zero. Think. There we go. So everything is now extruding outward a little bit. And now that that has happened, I might have overly subdivided, but his was very subdivided. So that's what we're going for. Create a subdivision surface, drop it in change it to a smoother mode and now we see we're going to get something like this if you wanted it curvier then we just shrink it not as much so i'm going to say 0.5 it's it's recalculating every time i click 0.5 so the tips here should get bigger and there we go now it's a little bit more rounded uh, and if you want it really sharp at the beginning um, well first of all we could just explode all of the polygons from each other uh, right now, they seem to still be connected. So the first thing we could actually do would be a poly, another MoGraph effect, another MoGraph deformer, a poly effect, which is an amazing effector. And this one, uh, this one will actually go second after the poly gun reduction. And this one is actually going to explode all the polygons as separate objects. So if I set this to 0.9, 0.9, 0.9, you see they all become separate polygons. So if we go like 0 0.99, 0 0.99, 0 0.99, they are disconnected, but they're very close to each other. And now when the Mo extrude does its thing, they're all extruding, but they're disconnected. And if they're disconnected, actually, it's probably going to round it too much now that I think about it. So now they'll be rounded, but they'll be disconnected. So you're going to get this uh, funky little pattern going. But yeah, they're not connected anymore. I kind of didn't think about that. So sorry, no poly effects. But we would use two Mo extrudes. Or would you make the first one push in? I'm trying to make it as parametric as possible. I mean, you could make it editable and that'd be more straightforward. Uh, but anyway, I, I don't even feel the need to go too much further than this. I think this is pretty much the effect. Uh, I think we even, to tell you the truth, shrank too much. If we were trying to make it more rounded, it wouldn't actually shrink all that much and this should round it a lot more uh maybe even uh just don't even shrink at all right now it's just getting extruded and then the, yeah the natural rounding of the subdivision surface is going to be what creates that rounding if we don't push it out quite as much then it should be a little more subtle and there you go 
That's uh, that's my guess there anyway. And we have very even triangles on this, and it's a very even mesh. But I think if it you know if it was based off of a uh, if it was based off of a differently triangulated mesh, then I think that is pretty much what you get. You just want to subdivide more or less, more or less, and you can see even as our pattern is changing, so we have tinier ones or big ones, they get larger or smaller. And that's roughly my take on it. Um, pimples. Do, 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 Back to the chat, which is very hard to find. Where is it? Oh, that's because I didn't pull it out from behind that question window. Yeah, multiple bevels. Yeah, I suppose you could just do it with a straight up bevel. And then you can maybe bevel a bevel. Yeah, there's a lot of ways to approach that one. I do love, I mean, you guys have seen me put how far I push the bevel deformer sometimes. I go crazy on it. Um, but anyway, oh, Meeks, uh, let's copy this over because I remember this question and it's really neat. Yeah, here we go. Now, uh, we don't. Is this from, what's the source here? I mean, it's, I, it, this is some sort of mathematical something. Um, so I'm not super worried about it, but we have the Avaronoi structure kind of infinitely growing from the center as it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, subdividing more and more and more. Um, so we want to try and build something like this. Let's go ahead and give that a little looky loo yeah, this is actually gonna be reminiscent of something we did uh maybe back in like episode one of this season um so here's the thought we need to make some sort of looping rig and then oh there's a loop somebody did something really neat with the loop and i was like oh that's that's a simplified version of what i had done in a good way I mean, we could just do a radial. I wonder if I'm even overthinking it. Like this could, this might be even simpler than I'm making it out to be. If we make this, I was thinking about doing it as a loop, but there's potentially even the simpler way. If we make a fracture and let's view it from the top and B comes solid. Don't colorize the fragments. Add a wee little margin. And then as a source, we'll just emit some particles. Simulate some very basic particles, particle emitter. Uh, let's look at this in perspective. Spin it. I'll turn these off just for a moment and make sure we're emitting the particles properly. So I'm going to say I want a 300 degree rotation, which isn't necessarily wrong. No, that is correct. I just have the orientation wrong. So let's zero that out again. And give, uh, this should be a height and width of zero. There we go. Now it's shooting out as in 180 degree orientation. The speed is too fast. So we'll slow those down. Create a lot more particles. I don't want to go overboard, but we'll crank those up a little bit. A few extra frames. Now eh, let's add even a few extra from there. So these should go for a while. They're all going the same speed, and eventually they're die. They'll they will die. I don't want these to stop, so I'm gonna crank up the emission stop point. And let's say they only live for hundred frames. It all depends on how big this plane is. Yeah, they're going to die slightly before it. So if they live for 150, I think they'll pretty much escape. Okay, they're just barely not escaping based on our current speed. Now, let's see how well this works. Feed this in as the source. So it's going to look a little bit weird in the beginning. But once the initial ones have been created, so once we've kind of got them to the edge, then now I think we've got it. Hit play. And we're just going to have an endless stream of particles being created from the beginning, shooting out towards the edge. And it's just going to 
go, it's just going to do this for infinity. And there's going to be a little bit more packing in the beginning because the ones on the outside are getting slowly further away from each other. It's running reasonably well. So I'm going to double our particle count. Looks really cool in the beginning. Um, actually, yeah, I really like that initial burst. Uh, yeah, really trippy. And yeah, as soon as he's reached the edge, then we are we're set up for infinite particles traveling. Now there'd be a lot of I'm trying to think of um I'm trying to think of what I might do for making this loopable to just make the question a little more complicated because that was actually easier than I thought it would be. I had a completely, I think you asked about it like four weeks ago and I said, Voronoi, um, particles. Uh, I had an idea of it and then you asked again about it last week and I said, you know, ask me again later and I had a completely different idea and now it's like, wait, I just had a completely different idea of how to do it. Um, so, okay, now the thought is, what if we wanted this to be a loopable thing? Obviously, the particles are not going to perfectly loop. So, uh, let's just immediately save it again. I'm always afraid that once I change a rig, I might save over the previous one. Uh, okay, so we need a looping rig. So, I have a couple different thoughts. One, hmm... I don't know if it's a good idea, but let's, here's the first one that pops in the mind is I'm going to make a straight spline with a helix and I'm going to drop it down to the minimal points because we just don't need that many. Create a cloner. The cloner set to radial and is already laying flat on the ground with a radius of zero. Create as many of these as we want to. Nice. So we probably want more, but let's start out with that and then create a matrix object. The matrix object is going to clone onto an object. The object's going to be a cloner. I probably have to put that into a connect. Eh, maybe. It seems to sort of be working. Um, currently, it's a count of 10 per segment. That could be fine. And set a rate. I'm going to set a rate of, I guess, 100%. Okay, not 100%. That's way too fast. Uh, I forget what the rate speed is, but you can see we get a loop here very quickly. Uh, set and there's an offset and we need an offset variation, but does the, oh, yeah, it's a rate variation. We don't want a rate variation. A rate variation is not going to loop, not per segment, uh, step. No, well, okay, maybe this is gonna be a little trickier than I was thinking if we're gonna make it loop because, uh, like if I put a rate variation, actually they're all doing the same thing always. So. I'm going to put this into a connect object. Clone onto that. And everything disappeared. It might be doing that because it's not acknowledging this as a spline. That's a thing we run into sometimes. So this becomes a spline mask. And now it appears. Okay. So that's a spline mask now. Um, I've talked about this before. There's a weird thing in cinema where it doesn't always acknowledge a cloner that's being fed a spline as a spline. But if you put the cloner into a spline mask, cinema is not like, oh, that. even though we're not linking to the spline mask, we're linking to the connect, it still acknowledges it. it you know, it's going to acknowledge it as a spline now. It's it's weird, but it works. Um, okay, back to the matrix. So now this might work. Uh, ooh, nice. Uh, okay, so I set this to... Uh, step mode. Well, it was, if we said count, we're going to get a set number of them. If we made exactly 100, we'll probably get exact, I guess it might be one more. Ooh, interesting. One less, one more per segment, smooth rotation. Oh, that's weird. It's forgetting one, but regardless, you can see as I increase this, we're actually getting very different patterning going. So that by itself is kind of cool. If I put it just on the one that looks like it's pretty even, yeah, lots of patterns. Put on the one that looks pretty even. If we make them offset and then add some offset variation, that's what we want. There we go. So now they're all offset with full offset variation. So it might be anywhere on the track. And now if I set the rate to 100 or set the rate to 10, they're all traveling at the same speed. But when they get back to their start point, then they should be looping. It should be a looping animation. So now essentially we've remade the particle rig, but we're in direct control over the way that they're moving. 
And when one reaches the end, it goes back to the beginning. And we can make as many of these as we want. So now just make sure that our plane object is small enough that it's always inside of that circle. Turn this on and acknowledge the matrices. We don't need to see the particle or the uh, splines anymore. View this from the top. And now you see we've got a very similar rig with all of these spreading out. But, and I'm not sure what frame it's going to loop on. I forget what the rate is. I think I've checked it before, but like a rate of 100 might be one second. We can try and let's see. Can we figure the math out? How easily can we do that? I'm going to say no offset. And if the rate at, well, let's put the rate to 100 and see how long. So it's at the very end. And if it stops at frame 30, yeah, frame 30. So 100% is one second. So if we were to cut that in a third, it would be 90 seconds. If we were to divide it, let's just divide it by five, which is a nice clean number. So now it should be 30 frames times five, and that should be the loop, or right? probably one frame less than that. That should now be a perfect loop. So if I hit play, this should hopefully do one. I'm going to scrub it quicker because you see right there, boom, we get to the end, and it should be the same as the first frame where it goes back to the beginning. So now if we were to offset them, they're all offset to different lengths, but they're all going to be looping back. So now hopefully, um, hopefully when we get right here to the end, it should look the same as the first. There's a little bit of a pop, but that might be, maybe I'm cutting it off one frame early, or maybe I need one frame after that. There's a little rotational pop. Oh, are they? Oh. There might be a little bit of a, we might be a get a, Maybe I'll fake that. <laughs> okay, I know a way of fixing it. So here's what my thought is. They are, oh, that's so weird. They are making one transition through the spline, but that is for one, how do I explain this? Um, one of these is traveling along the spline, but when it gets reborn, it's not getting reborn. I don't think it's getting reborn in the same spline. I think it's getting reborn to the next spline the next one of these lines going uh how can we prove that well we can prove it by going right here to the end yeah yep yep i'm right you see how that one is right there on that line if i rewind it's actually on a different line so to make this looping we're actually gonna have to counter rotate it which i'm entertained by um we can counter rotate it by doing this offset and i'm just going to record that and when we fast forward to the end we can see that's over there. So now I just want to rotate this offset. Uh, I, I'm just eyeballing it. Uh, what do we got? 150 frames. So we need, um, what do we got? 360 divided by 150, which would be, wait, that doesn't make any sense. 150. Oh yeah, I guess maybe it does. 150 divided by 360 or maybe 360. Okay, yeah, let's do 360 divided by 150 and now it's uh 2.4 it might that might be it it might have to be double that let's try jumping backward and forward yeah i'm going to double that amount times two and now let's go backward and forward they seem to oh the matrix is lagging one behind i'm going to move it below uh okay uh Maybe it was just lagging a frame behind that tripped me up. So apologies, but now we need to fix that again. I don't think I should have doubled. I'm going to say divided by two, re keyframe, rewind, fast forward. Okay, so here's maybe what I was thinking it might be is uh, we might need to go negative. Sorry, a little guessing checking on the numbers there, but oh, dang, it's still not quite there. I should just eyeball it. So let's try doing negative times two. Mm, close. It's close. I'm trying to. It, okay, there we go. See, close. I close enough. I'm just. I'm just eyeballing it. But the point being is, over the course of this entire animation, I'm just making that rotate that little bit as it goes. And now, now hopefully it's a loop. So, 
let's just jump to the end and there, yeah you see there's still that tiny little pop of that little pop well actually we probably have to cut the frame off again and and i didn't perfectly rotate it actually now it looks really 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 close so you can see as it goes i see the tiniest little rotation there that's, that's just my inaccuracy with the rotation good enough for me um so that's that's actually fine we have uh, a lot of options now as far as we can create as many of these as we want i could double the count really easily and yeah there'll be twice as many we can go five times as many none of that should change any of it and now we have direct control over how many they are and it should still loop let's see as soon as it goes there bink goes back and it loops and then we could we uh, to keep it looping we still have a lot of options we could make it we could make it go twice as fast so we could double this amount and that's actually going to do it in half of the time or it'll go twice over the course of this uh, i'm going to cut back on these so it's a little bit quicker hit play and um, oh if it's oh if it's if we're going twice the speed it would have to have twice the final rotation the count twice the counter rotation so let's just keep that in mind but yeah totally doable you have a lot of options for being able to move and manipulate this around um there we are just creating a lot of fractures actually something i'm curious about is does this offset fragment slow down significantly not really it's really quick calculation <laughs> Let's see, what else can we do here? I mean, you could clone more splines, you could offset them more. Um, but yeah, that'll create a looping animation. Pretty neat, pretty neat. Um, you probably actually get a little more mileage out of it if you made it round, but we don't need to do that. Uh, I can't really think of anything else to specifically do with it. We tackled some very technical aspects of it and it is neat. Um, so hopefully that was a good one. We're really, we're cranking through the questions today. You know what the, the slightly bad part is the more questions we answer, the longer it takes me to write my notes afterward. Cause I have to go and find all the links and then put all the descriptions in on YouTube and for Patreon. So it's just funny that the more questions we answer, the more paperwork I have to do afterward. Um, question window back to Twitch. Hi everybody. Um, Yeah, okay, yeah, it seems to work. Yeah, perfect, perfect. Yeah, and then we went further. So we not only do we make it nice and easily, we also made it looping. Um, could you make them bubble up and pop? Um, I mean, yeah. Uh, Mick is asking about, you know, if they were to bubble up and pop. That just turns into... Um, you need a field of them traveling upward. So um, I'm going to simplify... Actually, here's... Yeah, keep it real simple. Uh, if we make a grid of them, no, don't want to go crazy. We'll go 11 by 11 by 11. T for scale. Scale is big enough, so it's covering everything. Rotate it to some arbitrary angle. Actually, um, let's not even do that. Let's not rotate it. Instead, we shall just create a random effector. So now they're all randomized. If we visually hide them, all that you have to do to make them kind of look like they're maybe bubbling up and popping uh, would be to keyframe this traveling upward through the surface. So let's move it down so there's already they already exist a little bit. And then keyframe our Y position. Should have done that at the beginning. And now at the end, move it up as far as we can. It's not refreshing as I drag in the viewport, so that's why we're keyframing it. Keyframe that again, rewind, visually hide it. And now they should, tra yeah, now they're going to travel through our surface. And you see, they don't look like they're moving left and right. They look like they're kind of growing and then shrinking. Actually, they, they look like they're going to look like they grow. And then the ones around them are going to push them out of existence and they'll just keep on evolving into new shapes and new shapes and new shapes. And yeah, so you can kind of get a bubbling vibe going. I'll just save that as a little bonus one on top of it. Um, catching up. How many splines are there? Uh, there were 100 splines, 100 clones. Let's see. I'm going to check on YouTube. Uh, Rincon is asking how to melt a candle and wax all over the place. Um, a lot of that's going to turn into particle systems, probably. Um, 
Yeah, particle systems would be the way to go. Um, obviously, particle systems in cinema can be a little bit uh, tedious um, without using X particles. We've kind of been on a no plugin um, thing on this particular episode, so I'd like to keep it that way. Um, and then end it all with volumes. Uh, I'm trying to think of a MoGraph based way to do it. I mean, I can sort of think of some, but it, you, I don't know. It's a lot. A lot of it's gonna be faking it. Um, I wonder if um, I don't know. Actually, uh, I got some weird ideas. We're gonna we're gonna make this one weird. This is not. I would want to fake it. Like a faking it would be pretty straightforward. But let's try. Let's try making it more of a full-on simulation. So I'm going to make a cube and set it to 10 by 10 by 10, nice and even. Come on, 10 by 10 by 10. And then make a bunch of clones. So we're going to make clones in the in a grid form. They're per step, which is good. I'm going to say I want exactly 11 per step. So there's a little bit of space in between them. We might end up getting rid of that space, but that's fine. And let's go five by five by a bunch. So there's kind of our candle. So we're not going super detailed. And then I'm going to turn this into a cylinder shape. So we might actually need a little more resolution. How? Let's see. Yeah, I mean, you got to go pretty high to start getting a round-ish shape. So I don't want to go too far, though. Of course, we're on a live stream, so I can get, you know, we can get crazy if we are not careful. So... Uh, let's see what we can do. I am thinking we'll build something like that and then make them uh, make it dynamic, but we're, we're going to do some fancy things with dynamics. I'm going to say it's a rigid body and the f copy this, the floor. And right now if we were just to play, it should just do a full on collision. Everything's going to fall and explode and go all the place. So we don't want them to trigger immediately, trigger immediately. No, thank you. So, um, Velocity peak via Expresso. What's the best way to do this? I don't want it to be based on a collision. <laughs> no, definitely not based on a collision. So if we say it's by Expresso, we've done, I think we've done this before. I'm trying to remember what the rig look like. Can we move it onto the cloner? Let's see if we can do this. Why not? Um, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Oh, we, let's just do a MoGraph selection. What am I doing? We can do a MoGraph selection. Trigger. Um, wait, where did... I just saw a MoGraph selection. On collision, on Expresso. Wait, why did... Why did, am I losing my mind? It just, I just saw literally the, what am I missing here? Why is uh MoGraph selection? Oh, it has to be on here. There we go. It has to be on a cloner to have that. There we go. Now we can trigger it with a MoGraph selection. That's much, much better, much easier. In fact, alrighty now, yeah, we can just keyframe something now, or we could do a really slow growth. So. That should automatically be applying to children. And if we hit play, I think the whole thing will just collapse again. But this time, we're going to drive it via them being dynamic or not with a MoGraph selection. So we need a MoGraph selection. Uh, I kind of like to use growth on this, so we'll give it a try. Um, so we will use a MoGraph weight map. Everything is going to be red we're gonna use fields we need a start point so i'll create a spherical field and that will be up here at the top and it'll be really teeny right in the center that's actually fine if those turn dynamic actually i guess you'd kind of want i don't know i guess the middle does melt first but anyway i just want one so i'm going to give this a full fall off at full strength and shrink it until just one of them is there now let's see if we can get some growth working uh, I'm going to turn the dynamics off just for a moment. We should be able to just still see the MoGraph selection. What I want to see is a slow MoGraph selection grow. So we can create a freeze, 
set the freeze to add. So it's looking at what comes underneath it and we will grow by a radius. They're 10 units away, but we gave them some extra space. I'm gonna say 12. So that should just see the direct neighbors. And if we're gonna play right now, it should, yeah, it's gonna infect everything really quickly. And now blah, 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 they'll turn and they grow. If we set this to something like 25, it'll go at a quarter of the speed and slowly go. We're actually gonna want these to go pretty dang slow for doing a candle thing. Uh, fast enough that we can tell, but okay. So this should be fast enough for us to see something. We're gonna need a lot of frames for this. So we'll do 90 frame or 900. And now this should grow relatively slow. We'll add some variation on there, but let's just prove the concept before we get details. Um, so save it before we break it. Do, 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 do. Candle melts. It's a good question. I like this question. Okay, so we're going to have this grow. And as it grows, they become dynamic. So let's put the dynamics tag and drag. Oh no, the MoGraph weight tag doesn't work. But we got a trick up our sleeve. Let's go and grab a MoGraph selection tag. Now, the MoGraph selection tag might actually be able to grow by itself. So if we were to turn on use field, and I'm going to steal the freeze, copy, and delete, paste. I should have grabbed this beer as well, but let's just do that. This might just work automatically on here. Yeah, okay, it does. We can just do it directly on the selection tag. Ding, ding, ding. But if it didn't, I was going to transfer the weight from the weight selection onto that one, which would have been cool. Uh, I don't know if we have any use for that, so I'm not going to kill it. But I will move it off the object so it's not calculating. And okay, so now we get this growth and the growth should be able to be fed into our dynamic. So those are not dynamic now until this hits it. So now you can see they turn dynamic and they're hitting the other ones around it. So these are, it's going to slowly grow and you can see they're going to start slowly falling and eventually they're all going to start collapsing already. That's pretty neat. I like that. Um, so yeah, neat. I'll even save that right there because that's kind of a cool destruction type technique. But um I want these to be able to freely move a lot more than they currently are. So uh, the thought here is we are going to use, we are, these are cubes, but I'm going to say, okay, you look like cubes and you're going to, we like cubes because there's so few polygons. There's only six polygons, but they are going to be calculated not as cubes, but as ellipsoids, which just means a sphere. Um, or a stretched sphere, but they're square, so they should be perfect spheres. So it's actually going to be a little bit shrunk, but these should be calculated as spheres, which means they should be a lot more free to kind of roll around. You can see immediately they start kind of rolling and bouncing and popping. We don't want the popping, but you see that they're a lot freer to move. So, okay, once again, neat, good, uh, good progress there. Now, we've got gravity on. We need these to be losing a lot of their energy like a lot. So we could, I've been, instead of using damping, I've actually been pretty fond of using a lot of aerodynamics lately. But in this case, let's use some damping. So I'm going to add a lot of, um, a lot of damping here. So I'm going to go, I'm going to add some more, uh, some more angular. So it doesn't want to rotate too much, but I'm going to add like a lot of linear damping. So let's, uh, Okay, it's slowing them down a lot, but uh, like I said, uh, linear damping, you need to go really heavy with it. Otherwise, you're not going to see the effect. So now it's up at, um, yeah, so they're starting to travel slower, but it, you know, even now it's like, okay, 99.9, .9, and they're still rotating too much. I'm going to jump out to 55. They're still freely rotating a lot, and they're still falling very quickly. We need this to really slow down. I'm gonna, so linear might not be able to do it for us, so I'm going to say, you know, let's do another 10, 99.9. Um, wow. Yeah, so, I mean, well, it's just something you talk about. We're draining all this energy out, but they're still, like, now we're at the literally the smallest number we can. It does slow it down a lot, um, but uh not not nearly enough so we're gonna instead drag it drain out 90 percent of the angular damping and we're gonna put the linear damping back down to zero and let's try doing actually uh let's put them both to default and go back to using drag or right, try using drag so i'm gonna say 25 percent drag so okay that's uh, still falling quite a bit let's say oops, not that many actually maybe that many 
And then there's drag and lift. I don't know if lift is much of a thing here. I think it might just be drag that we're dealing with. So yeah, let's just use 99% of that. Um, yeah, so uh, the growth is still way too fast, but let's jump this up to 99.9. .9, and I think it's a little more controllable. Drag, uh, we could use damping and drag if we wanted to. I mean, everything's still so dang fast. Okay, I'm cranking this up as far as we can. Okay, even drag is not uh, super inclined to slow us down uh, that much. Let's see if both of them in conjunction will slow it down a lot. Now, you can just turn off gravity. I'm just seeing if we could counter it. Um, yeah, man. 99.999. Yeah, they just want to go. So, how do we, how do we do this? How do we make these travel? I mean, friction is the next bet. So, friction. Okay, uh, I like seeing things in isolation. So, let's put everything back to default and see what friction will do for us. Um, so, let's go up to 100. Let's go up to 1,000. There we go. Now, we're starting to slow down a bit. They still have an incredible amount of spin. I guess there's angular strength. Does that actually do it? Oh, it does do something with dynamics. All right, we slowed this down a lot, and now we actually have a number that we can control much further. So let's push that. Oh, okay, I forgot. Oh, yeah, even friction doesn't want to go beyond a certain point. Yep, does not want to go that high. Whoa, 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 whoa. Now I'm, oh, oh, whoa, interesting. I thought that, that that was working. All right, didn't like too much. Oh, no, it's still exploding. Didn't it work? It just worked at 1,000. Maybe it was already moving a little bit before I changed it. Oh, I'm disappointed. Friction doesn't usually let me down. Oh, come on. What's happening now? Um, everything is on default with just some friction. Uh, a couple things I'm just thinking about. Let's turn off their ability to turn off. There will be dynamic forever after that. And then... Also, I mean, we can do this in conjunction. There's a lot of bounce. And let's crank up the friction. Like, a lot. They are they're spherical. We do want them to be able to freely move, and they want to push off each other. I just don't want it moving too quickly. And then, once again, I'm, I'm avoiding using turning off gravity. I want to control it via these settings. Uh, we can use that blunt hammer when we get there. So, the friction, though, is super making things explode. Not... I was not expecting that. Wait, wait, wait. What's going on now? I, this is barely doing anything on the friction. They're still exploding. I've turned friction off. And now it's not exploding. Oh, friction, you've let me down. And you so rarely do. All right. Well, go away, friction. All right. So a couple, th a couple additional things. Actually, this might help. Um, another thing we want to do, although this might slow us down a lot, is I want to turn on dynamic force. And essentially what force is, is interdynamic object uh, attraction and repulsion. And currently it should be on attraction. So let's see what this does. Visually not too much there, but let's crank up the strength. And we should see, okay, right away, you see how it's like clinging to itself? So let's see what that, how that changes at the beginning of the simulation. So they're all getting attracted towards the center. And then they slowly are kind of blobbing their way down, which is interesting. Um, so that's a lot of strength and a really big radius. Now, these are not that big. So I'm going to do an inner radius of, uh, let's do 22 and an outer radius of... 55. I don't want them attracting each other from too far away, just kind of their direct neighbors. Oh, but now it's just their direct neighbor, so uh, more strength might be justified. Not bad. Some are escaping, sort of in a way I want. Um, inner distance. I mean, do we literally want them to be just their direct neighbor, in which case it'd probably be like 12 to 22. Does that work? Um, or I, I never know if I need to go about double the number or 
not. So let's try this. Uh, double the number is the distance between them. So I think that they should be pretty heavily attracting each other. Eh, the big, uh, back of 55 actually did seem to do something. So it's pushing it further than I thought we'd have to. Uh, I'm going to add a lot of damping. I'm not sure. Okay, well, damping goes a long way. Actually, this is draining a lot of energy from it. And let's put more strength. We're just we're just going to keep tinkering and seeing what kind of flavor we can get from here. But I think oh, you can see they're getting like sucked in. So now I am feeling like their radius is too much. So I'm going to shrink it again. Yeah, they're definitely attracted to each other, but they are free to move away. So that's something. Okay, now combining that with uh, a bunch of drag. 99.999. And then everything after this, if it doesn't kind of work, then we'll just start manipulating gravity and time. It's a little bit of a big old blob up there. Um, there's a lot of strength here, so uh, we got a couple variables to play with, but I'm going to try cutting the strength in half. I mean, it, it's, the entire setup changes, so We'd have to run it again. Yeah, I mean, this is a pretty good, like, uh, like building demolition type of thing. Yeah, still, oh, well, I mean, every time we change a number, other numbers are affected. So the uh, linear slowing them down, there's not so much gravity, and now the strength is, is overpowering, and now they don't have the ability to escape from each other. And now they sort of do, I don't know, it's, I don't know, I'm struggling a little bit. Uh, we got a lot of variables here. Uh, now let's go back to our freeze, back to the growth, and I'm going to slow it down. Let's go pretty slow. I'm going to drop down 3%, so it's a third the speed it used to be. It's going to grow a lot slower. So, um, and I just want to see, because it, essentially it's growing so fast, it's hard to tell what the uh, what they're doing. So, yeah, that's okay. And it does seem like they want to stay near the edge. And, when, you know, Obviously, we haven't done it yet, but the plan is going to be, let's just do it now. Let's save it as another version because it's going pretty well. Um, the plan is to create a volume builder. So we'll create a volume builder, a volume mesher, drop this into the build uh, volume builder. And the entire thing should blob really nice. And actually, let's just rewind and we get, let's see how, how well we can get our cylinder shape. So you got to be careful because we need enough resolution and they are units of 10. So we got enough resolution there. But if you smooth it, if we had too much smoothing and unfortunately smoothing is going to obliterate our, um, overall shape. So we got to be careful. Um, I usually just kind of jump through these and see what's giving the best result. Mean is not completely demolishing the uh, thing we're going for. That's not terrible. Um, let's go do voxel distance iterations. Yeah, two iterations maybe and a strength of 50. Uh, so it's still been quite rounded out, but let's just uh, continue from there. I'm curious uh, like what the calculation time is here, so let's try hitting play and I mean, we're still, I mean, our frame rate, I, I turned the frame rate off from some screen capture I was doing earlier, but you can see that our playback is not uh, terrible. It's not fast, but it's moving. Um, now, oh, is this not, is this not refreshing? Is it doing the not refresh thing or is it, no, okay, it is doing something. So like now let's, you know, now let's be like, okay, is it kind of feeling a little bit like wax? I mean, it's running slow. We'd have to cache it to go quicker. But, I mean, the middle is melting first, which is good. I mean, I, was, I wasn't even super thinking about that, but we do want the middle to start melting a little bit. Um, I mean, I'm super curious what this looks like. So uh, even though it's taking a while to calculate, I'm going to let this go. Ooh, that's looking pretty good right there. It's looking pretty good. Oh, my goodness. I think that this, yeah, I think this whole technique is actually going to have worked really well. So everything's just happening from the top and look at it all ooze down. Um, it's not bad. Blurp. 
Um, okay, neat. Uh, yeah, so it's it, we're getting a pretty good melt going. It's not perfect, but it's not bad. So there's some. I have some thoughts of where to go. Um, first of all, we can see what the effect is going to go now. Right off the bat, if we had this be a higher resolution, everything's going to look better. It's going to look better if we are feeding it closer to a cylindrical shape. But, um, but you know, we're, we're running this in the stream, so I'm going to keep it. I'm going to keep it at this low poly. But if we had, if we made more of them, it would work better. Okay. Next up, uh, let's have the growth of our starting point. Uh, first of all, I'm going to increase our initial one, so there can be some more points here in the middle that are already dynamic. Like there's no point in waiting for that middle part to boil and boil and boil. But once this has happened, let's add more variation in our growth on our field. So in the selection, we have our freeze and the freeze is growing. It's looking for anything that's within 12 units. If it's within 12 units, then it's going to grow. Now, actually, uh, I'm going to run the simulation for a second because there's something I need to see. When this grows, do these falling ones infect the ones that they're passing by i don't want them to it's hard to tell but i think they are yeah i think they are but um i think hmm i think we can get around that can we i think we can um, oh no, but then they move out. No, but then we can add it. Ooh. Um, give me a moment here. Um, what I think we need is this volume just the way it is, but one that doesn't move. So I'm going to make a copy of our entire rig and use a MoGraph. Uh, swap cloner matrix. So I've just turned this into a matrix. So we don't need the cube anymore. We don't need dynamics. And in fact, let's temporarily turn off our cloner. So this now has its own selection. And now this should grow and do its own infection and grow and grow and grow um, just on the matrix object. But you'll see that it doesn't fall. And because it's not falling, um, it's not... It's not, you know, it can't infect the other ones if it never moves. So with that in mind, the first step would be, can this cloner use, I'm sorry, can this dynamics tag use an unrelated objects MoGraph selection tag? It's going to be hard to tell, so I'm going to clear it. Let's drag it in. It did accept it, but will it do something? I hit play. Wait, we need to, let's hide the cloner in order to see it, I'm going to say 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, and then make it red. So those are the cloner ones. And let's hit play. And now these are moving and growing. So let's just see if this works. So the top should melt, but these falling ones don't seem to be triggering the next generation. So they, it's only going to melt from the top now. Excellent. That's definitely what we wanted. The growth comes from the top. All right. Now that's working well. Let's turn that off. And and that's, I think that's working because we have the exact same index of these clones and these clones. So they can share IDs and that's going to work that way. All right. Uh, I shouldn't have made that like that because we need to be able to see this tag grow. Now inside of the freeze, we are currently looking at a radius of 12 and the radius of 12, anything within it is getting 3% applied. So I think that we should double the radius. So we're going to go up to 24. And that is now big enough to infect the next one over from it. But the reason why we're doubling it is we are now also going to go into the remapping. With the, not, I'm sorry, not remapping. We're going to uh, twirl down the freeze. And you can see it has a special parameter that we can drive. And we can drive the radius via some other something. Now, some other something is going to be a random field. So with a random field created, I can feed this as the radius. Now we want to see what that looks like. So um, I want to see your viewport preview. And there is the noise. And um, I'm not sure what's, I'm not even sure what we want to go for here. We can make it bigger. And that's going to add a lot of variation in the way it's going to be spreading. And we can increase the 
Uh, I'm going to go to the curve mode. We can change some curve here. So I can make it a lot darker. So you can see there's only a little bit of yellow. And so where it's full yellow, full power, then it's getting a double radius. Where it's at 50%, all the oranges, then it's getting um, half power. And then the red is not going to be getting any or some smaller percentage. I'm actually going to crank up the yellow. So when it is getting applied, it's getting applied a decent amount. And the yellows are there as well. I don't know if this is a good amount, but in addition, and things can get left behind if we go too far with this type of technique. But I'm also going to give it an animation speed, uh, a slow animation speed, like 5%, which still might be too fast. But um, now these should not grow in a uniform way, but we might need to change our pattern a little bit to make it... Um, to get better control over it. But yeah, you can definitely see this one has traveled down further and over here it hasn't traveled down at all. So this bit of variation is definitely something that we're trying to uh, get. So we will hide that and I'm going to hide the random effector because I don't want to see that. And now we can turn our cloner back on and let's see how they're growing. So let's see, hopefully this will travel down this side a little bit more. I even kind of punched a hole here. That's kind of like I said, the danger where it can still leave some behind. Um, we could give it a minimum so that they're all always getting some power, but we don't want any floaters. A floater is bad. So we, we have to change We have to change the curve effectively because you can see here like a hole's getting punched in, which I think could happen in the candle, but it's a little extreme right now. So that's just what we have to be careful of. Um, because those can definitely get left behind. And then the animation speed has to like occasionally catch some of these areas. Um, so uh, definitely um, a little extreme. So I'm going to give it, I'm going to say all of them definitely get applied a little bit. So they're all getting a little bit of power no matter what. So let's start it again. Um, so it should happen a lot quicker overall. Um, yeah, a couple, couple stragglers. Um, that's the, oh yeah, we're not controlling. This isn't the weight, it's the radius. So if we want everything to get some of the power, this has to be up at least 50%. So this has to be up at 0.5 to make sure everything's getting at least a little bit of it. But we can go further. I'm going to make this go to a third. I'm going to say 3.33, actually probably be better with 33.0 or 3.34. And now everything, and now, oh, I don't want to, don't want to lose everybody, but the radius, currently the radius would have to be 11. Um, and I'm, I'm giving a margin of 12. So instead, we're going to give it a triple margin. We're going to make it three times the radius. So now you see it's it's way big. So even if you're a third the size, you're still getting some of the effect applied. But sometimes these are going to be spreading out further. So we are now saying, uh, I'm getting a little lost. Um, we are now saying that the freeze is looking at this random field and the random field is outputting at least, oops, at least a third. So everything's getting a little bit of power, but sometimes they're getting double power and sometimes they're getting triple power. Um, I think that makes sense. So let's really pull this handle out because most of the time they're not getting, they're only getting one third of the radius, but sometimes they get double and sometimes they get triple. So let's see what we... Let's see what we get. My hope here is we don't really get much in the way of stragglers because everything's getting some power. Not bad. Definitely have some variation. Um, yeah, that's better. Uh, now we need to slow down some more, but that's really easy. We can go back to the freeze and I'm going to apply one third the overall strength. So it's going to take three times as long, but you see it's spreading pretty quick. So I'm going to, this is just slowing it down a little bit fast, a little bit more. Um, so one almost got left behind, but then it did fall because everything's being forced to get some power. These are all starting to fall um, because of all the drag. They're not uh, escaping too far. Um, I'm going to go back to our dynamics and slow, uh, give it uh, the angular damping 99. So now they're, they're going to slow down the rotation even quicker, which should make them more less likely to actually fall off the edge. Cause they're not rotating as much. It's like a sphere laying on top of pile of spheres. And these are all going to keep on melting their way down. 
Now it's it's still quick, and I mean, keep in mind. I mean, first of all, this is not playing back in real time. We have to keep that in mind. So we're going to be counting. You know, we have to we have to slow it down because it's going too quick. Like wax won't fall that quickly down the sides. But at the same time, um, we need these to. Um, we got to keep in mind that we're not getting real time playback, but we need to get it to go slower. So we might need to. First of all, it'd probably be a good idea to go to our HUD and in the HUD, turn on FPS just so we can get some feedback on that. So you can see we're running at about six, five frames a second, six or five. Um, so we're, you're, this is, you know, six or five times slower than it should be. Um, now, but even at that super slow speed, these feel like they're falling pretty quick. So how many frames does it take until they start falling? Because we should probably start doing some caches. Um, actually, I'm not going to do caches. I'm going to do render to picture viewer because then we can keep working. Um, so we already saw that we were having to fight the linear and the drag. I'm gonna see if the two of them play together well. So if we put in some drag, I gotta say, yeah, it seems to slow down a little bit, but man, not that much. Um, so we are now at the stage where we have to use the brute force tool of dynamics uh, time scale or less gravity. Um, it's dangerous because if, if this was interacting with other dynamics and this is going to begin to affect that. But if we're working in isolation and you can always bake this when it's at slower speed. So I'm going to start out by lowering gravity so these can do their own thing. Um, and in the beginning, it's actually running a little bit quicker because they're not, there's not that many things simulating. Man, I do love the way they kind of fall in before they fall out, which I, I do feel like a candle would kind of round itself. So I like that. Um, oh, they are they are a lot slower. So actually, the uh, the force, the attraction, is probably keeping everything together. Yeah. So we got to lower this. Um, blur. We have every every time we change the number, we effectively have to start it over. At least we increase the initial radius so that uh, we don't have to wait a while for that to grow. Um, I just want to see if the early ones that fall, like you see, they're inclined to get attracted to each other. The energy is really getting drained from them. Um, what I'd love if, is if if you, we could start building some strings of these. That would be amazing. And if you have the proper radius, you can. And I feel like we do have the proper radius. Um, is that, is that a thing? Oh man, uh, we're already over time, which is totally fine. I don't have a problem with it. How's, how's everybody doing in the chat? Um, the, uh, you can make strings of these if we use two different forces. I feel like that's starting to go down a whole different trail. And I have a couple different thoughts of things we might be able to do. Um, but let's see. I'm going to add, uh, this one's attracting and this one is repelling and this is going to have a lesser strength. It's not going to really dampen that much, but it's going to have a much larger radius. Actually, oh uh, no, can we remap? Is there a remappable? No, you cannot remap. So yeah, so this is, or is it a greater strength? I don't remember. Um, let's increase. Let's increase that and increase this. So now what I'm saying is they're all kind of pushing each other away as a group. But if it's very close to something, it's extra attracted to it. Um, at the end of the day, I don't know. Uh, it's been a little bit since I played with these. It can get a little bit crazy. Because um, this is yeah, this is less damping. It's pushing, but those are pulling. I feel like the pulling is a smaller radius. So let's increase this more. There's still, I mean, attraction is clearly what's the driving force right now. Oh, wait, I should probably set it to negative, shouldn't I? Aha! Badoom! Uh, which is neat, but now I was overdoing it. So back to 22, back to about 44. Now let's see what happens. Whoa. Okay. Uh, oh, yeah. And we're going to go back to half the strength. So now, 
the idea is if it's very close to something, it should be very attracted to it. But otherwise, it's not. And I think you see here, like there's a pair of them and they are attracted, but they're less attracted to their direct neighbors. Like there's kind of a gen general push away because it's got a larger radius, but less power. Um. Yeah, interesting. I mean, it's definitely stopping the clumping. Um, but we're getting a, quite the cascade. Hmm, we've got a lot of variables here. It's really neat. There's a lot of fun stuff we've got going. Um, it's a... Uh, yeah, I'm going to keep on lowering the power because it's still, it's everything's getting flung away quite a bit. And I don't really want them to. And we might need to slow the growth even more because if everything's getting flung away, it, this seems to be enough now where they're not getting flung away. It definitely seems a little less sticky. So now if they fall, can they actually fall away is what I want. No, they're, now it's and now we've gone too far the other way, and now there's still the attraction is overriding the repulsion. I mean, twenty two definitely was enough to want them to push away from each other. Um, well, anyway, uh, like I, I can get lost in this kind of stuff for hours and hours, but we need to keep it moving. Um, so let's slow it down. Uh, we'll go half the speed of growth. And at half the speed of growth, hopefully they have a little more time to fall away from each other. I mean, the 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 reason I don't mind going over on this type of thing is that we are. This is applicable to so many things. We're getting so much cool like destruction simulation. Ooh, I think we might have a good combination now. Like we definitely had a couple get away. Um, yeah, that's not bad. Uh, so let's go even slower. Uh, I'm going to go one-fourth the speed of them growing. So there's just more time for one of them to escape. Um, I mean, I guess the one of the points here is like, it takes a really long time for a candle to melt. And we, we don't have an hour to watch like two or three inches of candle melt. So obviously it's going to be going quicker than real time. And even here, like where you're, geez, like at, at a effect strength of 0.125, Maybe I went too far because, like, this is just not going anywhere. Um, just do it again. Man, there's a huge difference. I, I cut it in half, and I cut it in half again. And it went really slow. And it might have gotten to the point where it's like the it's traveling, the noise is traveling too much for it to be able to grow. Or, um, yeah, okay. Well, at least that goes. I'll, I'll, I'll increase the initial radius. I kind of want the the these different drops to be able to fall at different speeds. I'm trying to think of a, some way I might do that. Nothing's immediately coming to mind. Or even some of them kind of like slowing down and fading. Uh, I can't really think of a way of doing that. But let's just uh, let them keep on dripping. But now here's here's the, the next layer I want to add in, which is these are all simulating. But if I create a tracer and we trace the object, not the vertices, and... Uh, we will trace, uh, or we will limit um, from the start, and let's give it 22 frames. They're moving pretty slow. Didn't I do it backwards? Yeah, I did it backwards. So now you can see we get a little bit of a tail, and yeah, that's way too slow. So let's do 100. So now you can see they end up with this little tail behind them. So that should be able to give us the string um, where it's kind of like this little blob that's kind of melting away. That's the hope anyway. Uh, I mean, even here, there's too many of them falling. We'd have to slow it down even further. The growth seems too quick. Um, but let's increase the spherical field so there's more at the beginning. Go! Yeah, that entire, yeah, that entire opening part's already melted a little bit, so we can... Maybe that's a little too much. Just a little. Yeah, I want yeah, want to fall from the top, not from the one layer down. Now, unfortunately, those all oh, they were all. I gotta shrink a little more. Those were all 
um, applied so quickly that they all fell at the same time super symmetrically. We don't want that. I guess the thing to keep in mind is if we're applying only point, like we're not applying 1%, we're applying a quarter of 1% per frame up to times three um, means that it's going to take at least 100 frames for something to get the first effect. Uh, Zach, yeah, that could be a thing. Like, different field forces could be a way of... Uh, uh, like, a wind blowing up in a, in a varied way, in a very vertical way, that could be slowly animated, so these would slowly change speeds. Um... That could be nice. Yeah. Hmm. Because the entire... We could turn off gravity entirely and just drive it with a field force. It would be kind of neat. Now, just way too many of them are falling. We just need it to grow slower. Which, you know, we don't have enough time to wait for them to grow slower. We'd have to... Um, I'm trying to think. Like at this point, it's like, okay, we want them, we want to see the growth, we want to see an effect quickly, but we want them to grow slower. So it's like, ah, what do we do? Um, I guess what we could do is just scoot this to a corner a little bit more, like shrink it, move it over here, and now let them grow slower. Um, oh, they have a tolerance too. That's interesting. The tolerance, we can make the tolerance really low, if that works. I don't know if it will. Um, but it could make it so the first couple grow really quickly. Yeah, but I don't want the entire side to explode. But the first couple might grow quickly. If we have the tolerance at one. But then, you know, the next one's not going to get any effect until that's gone further. I guess we get the first couple... I didn't even lower the speed yet. Oh, but I did change the threshold. Maybe it's inverse. Maybe it has a 99% tolerance and then... Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's totally a thing. So let's see. Yeah, this will give us more of an initial effect. Because if it's even 1% infected, then it's going to trigger its dynamics. But then the next one won't be caught right away. Uh, it's interesting knowledge, but it doesn't really help. But well, what, it, what that enables us to do is get variation on our initial one. So I can shrink this. And then those will go. And then these can grow a little bit. Yeah, those can grow a little bit, and then we get a handful of or originating ones. Um, yeah, I really want to get some variation on those. And I was trying to think, could we put different cubes with different uh, weights in them? We could have different dynamic, you know, different clones, but this is uh, actually on the top of that, so we can't do it with that. So uh, we can't really add variation. Uh, so we'll have to do it externally, and the best way to do that externally is with a field force. Simulate forces. I mean, if we just technically other ways we could do different things, but um, and this will actually slow us down a lot too. But let's see what we got. Uh, field force. So we have a field force. I want the field force to uh, let's give ourselves a cross section. So here's two hundred by two hundred by two hundred x y z. I don't want x zero. So now we get a cross section there and we are feed it a solid and the solid is saying blow upward. It's like, okay, cool. Blow upward. Uh, what we're going to do is turn off gravity. Goodbye. Gravity. And with no gravity, we have complete control over everything's only going to move if the field force is telling it to. So field force is saying everything go down. Okay. Excellent. Everything's saying go down. And then I'm going to mask that. So create a mask and inside the mask feed a random field. The random field will be in the mask. So set it to normal. Make sure it's affecting. I think we, I can't tell. I don't think we need that. Um, so we've got a field force. I'm going to make it really tall and bigger. And I'm not seeing effects. So let's turn it on. 
hard to tell. Um, I'm going to move this up so we can... Okay, it's really big. Okay, so yeah, so I made it way too big. So you see we get these little... Do you see how we're getting these kind of vertical stripes? So if that's a mask, it should be masking out the length of these. We should be seeing a line length. I'm going to make it times 10. It's a little hard to tell. It does affect the color. How can we visualize this? It's actually really important. Um, maybe, actually, maybe we should do a cross section. Zero, 200. Yeah, let's see if we're getting variation in the length. I'm not really feeling too much variation. The random is masking. Let's turn that on. Okay, we had to, we do have to turn it on because now you can see actually that they are getting some variation. And now that they're getting some variation, oh, I'm talking for a while, starting to lose my voice. Um, remapping, let's go to remapping and turn that on. And now via this curve, we can really manipulate how it's getting affected. Yeah, that's really cool looking. Look at that. Neat. So I can pull this way down and now it's saying like, there's a couple places where it's like, there's a lot of strength, but then there's a lot of places where there's not much. And keep in mind, this is very vertically centered. So uh, because we took this noise and stretched it really tall. In fact, we don't need it that tall. I'm going to make it like a thousand, maybe 2000. So there is definitely some vertical influence, but it's not forever. Uh, what do I need? Field force, display. I want my cross section again. X will go to zero. And now hopefully we can see our, yeah, we see our vertical stripes and you can kind of see how they're stretched. And now with that going, I'm going to add a little bit of animation speed. And when I say a little, I mean a little, we'll just do 1%. And these should slowly change over time. And now keep in mind, there is now no gravity. We turn gravity off. So the only thing pushing things down is this field force. So these are doing their own thing. Now, some of them are floating. That could just be from a straight up collision. So we might need the field force to be stronger. Um, yeah, let's just make it stronger. I mean, it starts out really weak at five. I usually set things to 55. So yeah, at 55, everything should be getting some strength. I'm going to drop it to 20. And now everything should be falling based on that speed. And yeah, that one's moving quick. That one's moving slower. Excellent. Okay, I'm going to start the simulation over because it was floating. So let's see if this gives us anything interesting. And then we'll, if it does look good, we'll put it back in our blob and see if the tracer tails are doing anything for us. Uh, I feel like everything should be getting a little bit more. Some can go faster, but some need, hey, you need something on all of them. You can't just have them floating. So fortunately, we got to start again. Okay, it looks better already. Big old blob of wax. So we, you know, of course want these growing slower, but let's just see what we get here. Um, hmm. I mean, an awful lot of them are falling. Our initial burst is very strong. So many. It takes so many frames to get there. Melting a candle, man. Who would have thought that a melting candle would take a while? So, think a dink a do. Um, did this just go to like too many are infected right at the beginning? So, we need to give that a little more time to grow. So that initial, yeah, um, the free, um, is the, there's a freeze on there. I'm worried that the freeze has been remembering. 
yeah, the freeze was remembering. You see it just changed. So all those times I was shrinking it, it was remembering the initial state. So there we go. That should be better. So now, now they're not there. It was, it was remembering from the biggest possible state it ever was. I mean, there's still a big burst at the beginning. This isn't amazing. Eh. Let's speed these up. Let's give it uh, more power. Let these start falling away quicker. You know, we gotta start. We gotta start making this look a little bit more like a time lapse. Um, the uh, tracers are long now because we're, if we're going to start making this go quicker, we can't have the tails be that long. I mean, it's, it's still melting so quickly. I mean, it's, it, it, think of how slowly this is growing, but every cube that rolls off of this is if that's supposed to be a drop of wax is like there's so much wax dripping at any given moment and as slow as they are as slow as that is it's still so much um but anyway uh i want to see a little bit more of what the end result is so there's our blob here's this and now we need to feed in the additional variable of our tracer Um, what did I just do? I put the tracer in the tracer. <laughs> Let's go put the tracer in the builder. Put the tracer in the builder. Whoa. What is that? There we go. That refreshed a little bit better. Uh, tracer in there. Tracer has a radius and a density. Let's give it lots of density. A radius. I, the radius can't be that small. And we could scale along. We got to be careful because it could just start floating, which is dangerous. Um, I can't think of any way of making the travel easily inside. Scale per segment, please. That's not bad. All right, we'll do that. So that the, there's definitely like an apply. Uh, uh, you can see there's an implied trail there. As long as they're not floating. Hit play. The amount of calculations going on, that's actually not taking a, that big of a hit. Turn off the visual of the tracer. Oh, that's a great looking melt though. Look at that. Look at that. I mean, this is more like a candle with a heat gun on it, but there's definite like areas of emphasis. Look at... uh. We'll look at the emphasis there. Um, well, it's looking really nice. I'm going to give us some more frames so it doesn't cut off. Let's create a nice, uh, slightly waxier looking material. Um, I guess it would be... I, I, I'm not going to go... This isn't like final render. I just want to look better in the viewport. So we'll make it look a little bit shinier there. And then... Uh, we'll just give it a little bit of luminance to fake some SSAO in the viewport. Like that. All right. Now let's just let it play for a few frames and see what we've sort of made here. Actually, even better, let's uh, send it to the, the viewport so you can see it back in real time. Because you got to keep in mind that we're only getting two frames a second at this point. But it's pretty nice looking melt, I got to say. So... Uh, yeah, I don't have to rewind to send it. Although, yeah, I might need to. Uh, all frames, output, uh, open hardware GL, open GL hardware. Or, yeah, hardware, open GL, open, or turn on enhanced. Uh, I guess that's AO, why not? Um, that's fine. We don't need any of this other fancy stuff. It doesn't get too big, so we'll just do that. And I think we can just send it. Hmm. 
top looks a little bit weird. But, well, if we're just doing it from there, let's rewind. There could be a, an issue where, yeah, there's going to be a refresh for a frame. And also, I don't trust the... I'm going to stop it. I don't trust the... Uh, this, the uh, Mogra selection. The freeze, when you move the freeze around, sometimes it remembers. So you got to clear the freeze. So with that having been done... And we'll just hide the spherical view clip. We don't need it. Let's send that, see if it looks better. Uh, yes, so it definitely seems to. It either remembered something, but before it was like collapsing right here, it might have remembered the current state of it because we didn't rewind the, the viewport. It's actually very, it's a tricky thing. Oh, actually, uh, Tobias is saying change the candle to a skull. To tell you the truth, because of the method that we're using to build this, we might be able to turn this into any shape that we want to. It would just be how many cubes are going to be created to create that voxel shape. So that actually might work. So yeah, um, I think I don't know if you were joking or not, but I think we could feed in any shape that we want. Uh, as long as you're willing to wait the time for that many cubes to get generated. Um, so let's see, I'm going to see what the chat's up to while this is all going. Uh, I'm not going to comment on all of the are we re recreating thing. Um, let's see. Do, do, do. <laughs> never has melting wax been so entertaining. Uh, yeah, I guess that's when everybody's stuck inside. Um, oh, that's looking so good. Um, now, one thing that's you know, generically what's cool is that it's going to maintain its volume because it's a bunch of cube spheres, but we're adding these tails on. So technically it's increasing its volume a little bit based on that, but those will also fade away when they stop moving. Um, now I do think we're going to get this kind of big initial blob because we always would see that. But once we get to, once we get to about 900 frames then, and also I, I forgot, but this is just going to be a thing. Um, when you're running, when you're open, running the open hardware renderer. Um, it doesn't, it can't cache that many frames, even though I lowered the resolution pretty low, it's just something it does. Um, so, I mean, we can possibly scrub or export, but this is more, let's see. Actually, I'm curious how fast it's going. No, it's not bad. It's, it's kind of a time lapsey wax. And the, man, the variation, that little bit of variation we did with the field force pushing, just pushing gravity downward, but it, unevenly even though we had that giant blob it's actually breaking itself apart pretty well uh when this is done i can export it as a video but sometimes that can actually take a while because it's got to pull everything from uh from ram or uh, it's not on ram so it has to pull it from hard drive into ram and then save it i think so it can take a while um you can change the amount of memory the picture view can use really i've never done that um this might be a lot of memory i'd be worried about killing it from um uh oh, did I just I just went to preferences and I might have killed it. Oh, there it goes. Wake woke up. Uh, I don't know when I saved it last, but I'm gonna save it again. <laughs> no, don't save that. Save a new version. But I mean, uh, hopefully you see kind of work on my workflow here, where like I had the theory in my head and I was spending a lot of time on that before. It's like, oh, let's see if we can make it look pretty as far as like the actual wax melting now, because I knew those were the steps we could go to. If we were trying to run all of our simulations at full, like full quality being like, oh, a high, a heavy resolution with the splines tracing um, and then putting that into the volume, it's going to take so much longer to calculate that you can't iterate that many times. So it's just sticking with those cubes and letting that do the simulating. Um, you know, we probably got twice as many iterations in as we would have otherwise. Uh, memory renderer. Picture viewer memory. Um, yeah, unlimited to hard drive. We can easily double that. I wonder if it, it takes place immediately. So let's say times two. And it, by doing that, will this line suddenly get twice as long? That's my question. Actually, it does seem to be. Neat. Uh, yeah, thanks for that heads up. Uh, but yeah, it totally hiccuped. But at the same time, we are super live streaming and calculating crazy dynamics um so interrupting cinema and saying no no do this like I'll, I'll give it a pass um just use like half your ram i think i've got a lot um 
I don't want to. I don't want to push the ram too far. Um. Because well, I know how what to cut it back. But if the stream starts getting choppy, then we'll have to fix it. I'm gonna double it again. We'll see how that goes. Look at it melt. But what's so cool is that this isn't this isn't like we're emitting particles. That is the top of the candle falling. As it's looking weird because nothing's gotten to the bottom, but once it starts blobbing up down there, that should be good. Uh, at a glance, I can already see the... Um, you see right there, there's some pinching happening. That's because we're letting our spline get too thin. This uh, tracer inside of the volume builder. Uh, I didn't pull it down all the way, but it's far enough that's like, nope, I can't calculate that. Um, and honestly, it could be that way because our current, the radius that this is being fed, actually, the radius is currently 11.5, and it probably should be 11. And then that is more than double our voxel size. So this could be just barely below 5, but the safest would be if we put it at exactly 0.5. And now it can't shrink below voxel size. It can shrink, but it won't shrink below voxel size. So that's not going to help us here, but damn, that's something we just learned. Still melting. It's going to start pooling up a little bit on the bottom. I guess it will technically lose the volume once it gets down to the bottom. They're still being traced, but the tails will be so short that they won't be creating volume. If these were moving really quick, they'd have really long tails and there'd be a lot of volume created via that. Um, but yeah, especially, I mean, I think the attraction is still on here. So they're they're attracted to, oh, they're not dynamic yet. So I'm not sure if it's attracted to the surface of the candle or not. But yeah, we like, some, you know, we could totally, I think, make the skull, you know, you could make a skull a model. And if it's a giant voxel, then it could start doing it. It would grow from the center out. Um, I wonder if there'd be any smarter do, things to do because, you know, it tends to make a very flat pool. Um, of liquid wax. We, we're not really accounting for like a flat pool of liquid wax here. Um, we'd have to do some sort of force being applied from the outside that's like cooling it, which would be counter pushing it. Um, there's, you know, there's potential for that if you were to do take the shape, feed it in as a surface calculation, and then say that shrinks the radius more. Um, then it would make it more reluctant to melt the very edge because there's more surface area. Um, Potentially, we could also have the. Um, well, you can't. I'm trying to think. If, if these were fully dynamic, if we treated the weight, if we treated the weight, I don't think you could. I'm trying to think of there's ways you could like essentially cool it off again. Like if right now, as they fall, you know, if the heat source is here and it's all melting down, if they move away from the heat source, it could start cooling and kind of come to a stop. Um, there's potentially ways to do that. Uh, I'm not going to worry about it, but you totally, you totally could like there, there, there might be ways of going deeper on that. Um, I'm surprised. I'm impressed that the Ram will update while it's in progress. I mean, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't give super give the impression, but you can see the the candle is super shrinking from the top like it's super totally melting so like conceptually i think we are we're pretty good here and this is why i love typed out questions is like we're making something new this isn't derivative so that's that's neat i like that kind of thing um is the initial shape getting less tall oh no it's definitely well, somebody just asked the question as i was showing it so um yeah it is totally shrinking so that's the whole point of this is a uh that's going to shrink. I mean, it's going to be lagging a little behind because the tail of the object is going to have to go, but it's just, it's just that little bit of lag. It wouldn't really be visual. If we cut, I would probably want to cut the um, the growth in half here. These are falling or turn double the gravity. Yeah, we could double the gravity and then these would be falling quicker um, or cut the growth in half so that these parts are falling slightly slower because it's real chunky right now. Like I said, this is like a, this is a heat gun effect, less than a uh, a wick burning on the candle. Mm. 
But yeah, the idea of these cooling as they go down, that'd be pretty neat. I love seeing the candle shrink from up there. I, like, it, I guess there is a danger here. We got to be careful. Those tails, like when you look at it, like how slowly the top is shrinking, like a lot of material is flowing down the sides. Um, and that is all because of the tracer. Otherwise, it'd just be like a little lump and then it wouldn't feel like there's such a discrepancy from what's getting left behind and what is falling. So you can see like it's shedding 10 times as much material as it actually is shrinking. Um, so the tails should probably be shorter. Um, I mean, the tails are unrealistic. It just, but we're, we're running a very, 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 very low, I'll just say like a low poly simulation here. There's just not that many particles in our simulation. So you, and we'd need them to grow and grip each other as they are pulling. But, um, that's definitely a kind of a push and pull we'd have to do. Uh, I mean, this is just going to keep on calculating here. I made a change, but anything, you know, any change we do, I'm going to have to start the simulation over. Um, I would love to make these fall twice as fast, make the tails a third as long. Cause if you're making it twice as fast, the tails already have to be half as long. Um, it would still be gr shrinking at the same rate right there. I don't want to make it go any slower. In fact, for our purposes, it might be good to go a little bit faster, man. They're working really well though. Starting the pool up a little bit on the bottom. I guess I could. Mm, no. I don't know. There's a lot of additional details. Uh, I kind of want to start the simulation over again with the changes I was just describing. Um, I'll let it run a few more frames while I'm making the changes. Dangerous to make it, but hey, I've saved. So, um, field force. Uh, I will double the strength. And then, so those will go down twice as fast. The tracer, like I said, we could cut it in half, but then it's going to be the same as it is. So I'm going to cut it in, uh, I guess, a th uh, 15, kind of split the difference. Not quite a third, but um, the tails will be shorter now. They're calculating, they're going to shrink, but that we shouldn't get the pinching as much as we were before. Um, if we increase the resolution of the mesher or the builder, then we could actually shrink everything a little bit more. I could make it so that the lines would get thinner. Um, let's, um, okay, well, I'm going to stop the render. Let's see what the last few frames gave us. I mean, obviously just more of the same. It's pretty good though. It's pretty good. All right, I'm going to stop it and then we'll start it again. And this should be running at tw you know, a part of the effect is going to be twice as fast. So they'll get down to the bottom quicker. Um, think, think, do anything else to change? No, I like the way the top is going. No way to do the cooling effect without completely changing the rig. So I don't see any reason to do that. I kind of like to see them pool like more, like spread out more, but I think a candle would kind of like climb up itself a little bit. So maybe not so much that, um, anything else to change? I mean, not, that's not, we're not really changing much, but let's see, uh, let's see what it does with the extra gravity. It could dramatically change the way the, um, uh, it could dramatically change the way the field forces are going. Um, da, 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 da. Hmm. Uh, let's see. Any other questions? Are there any not, well, I mean, are there any questions that don't require me interacting with a scene file while we talk? Because I don't want to, oh, I'm going to start it again. I hate, I hate seeing the axis in there the entire time. So there we go. I, I just clicked off it and now we can run the, run it without seeing the axis. Um, yeah, any questions that are not going to require me to manipulate cinema that we might be able to cover a little bit and then uh, see what it goes. Um, let's see. Uh, thanks, Mick. Um, yeah, uh, 
JM, I agree. Cinema 4D, like there's a there's a lot more power in it in the last two years than there was before that because we had things like Field Forces. The idea of being able to build this type of rig, and I mean, I I tend to push the boundaries of it more because that's kind of where I like. That's where I like to live is on this te- on the technical side, and um, I think a lot of you know when you use Houdini, you have to think of it in a very particular way because it's very technical and you're you're building technical rigs. Um, in cinema, we've been very used to throwing dynamics on on some spheres and then creating a cool shape. And it's like, cool, like now we've got some cool looking motion graphics. But the idea of pushing it and letting it actually do some VFX and letting it do some some deeper simulations. And even the idea, I've talked about this a little bit, that with the, uh, with the addition of R20 and R21, that a lot of times that you maybe before you were like, I have to do a particle simulation with this. You don't have to use a particle simulation anymore. You can do it with a clone rig and things growing and changing and morphing via vertex maps, transferring things from one place to another. You can build like key frameable rigs and not just wait for a simulation to do its thing. Now I know in this case we are running a simulation and that's, you know, that's cool. But once again, we are just using vanilla R21 to do all of this. So, so that stuff is fun. I guess I'll keep the screen on just so we can see it as it goes. So of course the beginning is going to still be a little bit slow. Uh, they seem to be, there's a little bit of popping there. They might be, uh, when they're doing their initial movement, they must be popping into their position. It seems to settle itself down quickly, but we'd have to look at what the just the cubes are doing to be certain what that was. Uh, let's see. Uh, Xlist had a question. I don't know if this is something I can answer without running cinema. Is it possible to control one axis of the clones but block the other two? Um, yeah, I see. So you want... Um, uh, yes, yes, actually there is, uh, we, I, I don't want to say discovered, but in one of the bonus streams, um, I guess I should mention this. There is a bonus stream, uh, for people who support on Patreon where every Thursday I do a follow up, and it's like, oh, let's play some more. So there's a good chance we'll be playing some more with this wax stuff and anything that gets really interesting. It's just kind of like, I know I know how to, <clears throat> I now know how to do that for the next time the question comes up, or I can make a tutorial out of it. And uh, in that one, we did figure out a way of doing that. And uh, I, I don't want to, if we do something in cinema, it's going to crash or I might freeze a computer or something. So I don't want to do it. But we did actually do that where we used a connector, uh, a three axis connector. And we said that it could only move. And we, we stopped, we filled like a, a shape with cubes that couldn't rotate. They could move around, but they couldn't rotate at all. Um, and I think, I wonder if we put a connector in and let them float around is a connector if that could enable them to rotate on one axis. I haven't tried that. It'd be really neat. I, I mean, I'd love to to click it and see if we could do it, but we can't while we're doing this type of simulation. We can't run a, we can't run a viewport simulation while we're doing this kind of thing, even if I ran a second instance of cinema. There's some popping in there. So there's like little uh, little bubbles of water in it, and they're, they're popping when the wax happens. Um, the first blob is great. Yeah, it, these falling down quicker are going to make it look a lot more waxy, I think, because um, you know, the tail seems really short. Um, so maybe yeah, maybe I went overboard on shortening the tail if the tail is only that long. Um, but, you know, not necessarily a bad thing. Also, there's potential where you could run like uh, you could trace multiple times and then they kind of build up on top of each other. Uh, yes and no, not really. Now I think about it, it's not really a thing. We could make a long tail with a thinner. Yeah, maybe you could add, trace two times. The second one would have a longer tail, but be fed in at a smaller radius. So there'd kind of be like this leftover, but you'd still need it to slowly fade. Otherwise, the top of the candle would never melt. If you if the tracer lived forever, the candle would never look like it melts. I like how one of these escapes really quick and starts going. And then suddenly we're going to get this big explosion of them all going. That's not surprising. One just gets out quicker. Um... But Xlist, hit me up, come back next week, or uh, if you are supporting on Patreon, then maybe tomorrow, and we can do that. Um, uh, jumping back to Twitch chat. Uh, we got some questions coming in, but we'd have to be talking. Uh, where are you? I can't, I can't do cinema stuff. Um, let's see. <laughs> 
James just asking uh, how I'm coping. Um, I don't know when I'm super, I don't know, you know, when you're in the summertime and you want to go out and do things, but even then, like, I, I don't go crazy and go out all the time. It's like, oh, I might go out once a week. Uh, me and my brothers who, you know, are with me here at Rocket Lasso, we, we, we always go out to eat on Mondays and Fridays. We're not doing that. We haven't done it for the last three weeks. Um, besides that, um, this is not terribly different for me. Um, as compared to like a regular time where I'm, where it's kind of wintry and cold and, uh, there's not too much activity happening. It's not terribly different for me. Um, I mean, obviously it feels different, but my day-to-day activities have not changed much. Um, although I gotta say like the, like the way the, the constant bombardment all the time, it does make you start feeling a little bit claustrophobic, even though I, you know, I'm, I tend to, I, I'm, you know, I'm naturally introverted. I like recharging my batteries at home. Um, so like if I'm going to go to a, like a party or something, I need to be meant, I have to have a mental warning. If somebody's like, hey, you want to go to a party right now? I'm like, no, that sounds like a nightmare. But if it's like, hey, two weeks from now, there's going to be a party. I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm prepared for that. That could be fun. So, um, so you know, my, my average day to day has not changed all that much. Um, the, uh, the other fun thing is we, me and my brothers, uh, at lunch, we usually watch one episode of something and because we're working, um, uh, because we're not going to eat out to eat, we're at home all five days for work. So we've been watching our way through Reboot, the cartoon, um, the old 3D, the old CG cartoon, the first fully CG animated show. And it is uh, Reboot and Beast Wars, the both shows made from the company Mainframe. Um, and these came out back when I was in high school or maybe in middle school. Um it's what made me want to get into 3D. So rewatching the way through it has been really wonderful. What I love about uh, Reboot is that the show, the writing gets dramatically better as the show goes on. They clearly get better at writing and they start finding their footing and getting the tone and they start having a lot more fun with parody and the, and the computer graphics get better as it goes. It's just, you see the evolution as it goes. And it just reminds me of like the games we played when we were kids of like, oh, I have this crazy idea. We're going to do this. And then like minor characters become main characters. It's really fun. So, but because we're, uh, because we're not going out, we're watching five episodes a week. So we're actually going through it relatively quickly. Um, it's hard to tell how much I left the tails. Like, I guess, oh, that one's moving maybe a little bit slower. Yeah, I mean, they, they seem to have decent tails. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's really neat. I mean, we could just sit here and chat all day, but I do have other things I probably have to tackle. And then the the export starts getting really long. Um, so let's see, any other questions to answer? Otherwise, I think, I mean, I think we'll end up revisiting this, but as far as, um, and then hopefully I'll post on Slack the... Uh, maybe a, the final animation of this, just so we can see maybe how it pools or finish like completely finishes. Actually, I didn't, uh, I didn't think about it, but we're, it's not going to be done melting at the end of this. It's only like a, like a fifth of the way down when we're at the halfway point. Um, but yeah, I'll post that in the Slack channel. Uh, I guess it's a good time to mention everybody. Um, there's a Slack channel. Uh, if you go to rocket lasso Slack, Dot com. You can sign up for free and there's a bunch of people, pretty much everybody's already hanging out in the chat. They're all in the Slack and everybody just chats and helps each other out and asks questions and answers questions. And there's actually a really cool challenge going on right now to pick an artist and then design a lamp based on their style, what you think they would have done with a lamp. Um, I, I know it was stated as... Um, it was originally stated as like, you know, picking a classical artist, but then... Um, but it goes to like, I want to see a, a, a Geiger, an HR Geiger or is it Geiger? It's an HR Geiger or HR Geiger style lamp. And I want to see like, uh, like when I had Googled uh, lamp, there's some lamp stuff, there's like Tim Burton-esque lamps. It's like, you know, I want to see stuff like that as well. Um, so, but yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of cool potential in all of that. So I'm really excited for that one. So if you're not already in Slack channel, you should totally go and hang out. Uh, otherwise, um, if you've found any of this stuff helpful, if you like the kind of stuff I do and you want to support it, uh, the tutorials and the live streams, then you can head out over to Patreon. That's a great way to support. And I super appreciate it for anybody who does. Otherwise, I'll see you on the Slack channel. See you in the bonus stream tomorrow. And um, anything else? No, it should wrap it up. I'll see you next week. So bye-bye, everybody. See you then.
Do, 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 do. Finding the right button. There it is. Bye.